Why don't we get started? Uh, a few more people checking in, but I think just about everyone's here. Um, I'm going to open the fall special town meeting. My name is Jason Tallerman. I am your moderator. I'll call this meeting to order, and I declare that the warrant has been duly posted and published, and I hereby declare that the reading of the warrant be waived. If we could all stand for a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Before we get started, um, just a few kind of community announcements. On December 16th, uh, Norfolk Carols welcomes residents to the Town Hill at 5 p.m. to sing Christmas carols. This is the second annual gathering. Uh, I believe there's a separate Facebook page on this um, and some other information online. Please come uh, and make it a success. Um, the Norfolk Grange is hosting a theatrical production of the Christmas Carol on December 8th, 9th, 15th, and 16th. I think that there's some information available on the tables um, and also a lot of information available online. Please support this great event, uh, great use of the Grange, which we've all put a lot of effort into uh, sprucing up. There's also going to be a showing of Peter Pan at uh, high school on December 8th through 10th. Uh, it is rare for the high school drama program to do musicals. Please come and support that as well. Um, it was another banner year, banner fall for King Philip Sports. The volleyball team again advanced to the state sectional final. The girls soccer team won their state sectional as did the field hockey team. The marching band placed second at nationals and the football team won its second consecutive Super Bowl. Congrats to all, can we have a round of applause for these great kids? The, I wanted to make an announcement on behalf of the Senior Center. They offer, especially at, at, uh, during these, this holiday season, the Senior Center, uh, Center offers a variety of services for seniors in need. Um, they process applications for food stamps and fuel assistance. If you get to them by December 15th, and if you know a senior in need, they can help provide a home-cooked meal for the holidays. You can call the Senior Center at 508-528-4430 for more information on that. And is Jeff Chalmers here? Jeff, you, um, Jeff wants to make an announcement on a program that he has been working really hard on that is really beneficial to Norfolk residents. Cool. Anyone from down here? Right here to Mike, Jeff. Good evening, all. Everyone here? Yes? Good? Beautiful. Um, during the beginning of December, end of November, I created a program. It's more of a community initiative. It's called Wednesday's Supper. And essentially, it's just in need. It's to help people who are in need in the town. Um, I've served on the school committee for the last several years, uh, and I also work pretty closely with some of the police officers. And some of the discussions I've had over the last couple of months, I think, have been more eye-opening than anything. The town itself is a very affluent community, and as part of that, there are a lot of lost people that I, I don't think a lot of us know about. So this program is the first and third Wednesday of every month. Um, we basically serve a hot meal for anybody who is in need. Anybody who wants to come down, who uh, feels that they want to have a hot meal, we're, we're going to provide it. And it's for the town of Norfolk, as well as the surrounding towns. If anyone has any information they'd like uh, more information about, there's a website which is wednesdayssupper.com. The information is right over there on the table, and I'll be around if anyone has any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Great program. Um, <laughs> last, uh, near and dear to my heart, um, there is a brand new, and you might have read it in the local newspaper, Frisbee Golf Course at the middle school. Anyone interested? It is a, a great new program. They've got a bunch of kids interested in it. It is a lot of fun, uh, nice walk, please go use it. Okay, before we get started, I want to introduce to my left, uh, Carol Green, our town clerk, with Anthony Turry from the town clerk's office, and Todd Lindmark, um, town accountant, I believe is finance director, Dave DeLuca, town council, Jeff Palumbo, selectman, chairman of the board of selectmen, Scott Bugby, Jim Lehan, selectman, and our town administrator, Jack Hathaway. 
In front of me is Steve McDonough and the rest of the advisory board, and they will be reading uh, most of the motions. Okay, want to talk a little bit about rules for the meeting before we get started. I will be happy to explain procedures as needed and will recognize requests for points of order and any other need to slow down, which would be a point of privilege or anything else that people need to understand what we're doing here tonight. Motions are going to generally be made by the advisory board, except for a few exceptions. Um, and sometimes what you'll hear is a motion for indefinite postponement. I don't know if we have any of those tonight. If you hear that, that's essentially a motion to dismiss or reject the article. I just want you to understand what that is if you hear it. If you, if you make a motion, you are going to have the first opportunity to be heard on that motion. Motions and motions to amend must be in writing, provided that if it's a ministerial or clerical or typographical issue, I will accept a friendly amendment. We will also, myself and Carol, will help with any procedure, we'll help write things out, we'll help you word things correctly if that's what you need to do. There's going to be some debate on a few articles here. It's going to be on both sides of it. I will try and balance that discussion as best as I can. Um, everyone will have a chance to speak on a matter, but at a certain point, if we're just being repetitive, I may move that discussion along a little bit. By our local bylaw, there's a max of five minutes to the mic at the first time and three minutes for the second time. I tend to be a little lenient on that, but please try and respect everyone's time and get to the point as quickly as you can so we can get through all of the debate tonight. I may occasionally allow someone, especially a proponent of an article, to speak a third time, but let's try and limit our comments appropriately so everyone can uh, be heard. All comments and questions come through the moderator. I don't want any conversations going back and forth. If you do want to speak, come up to the mic uh, and give your name and address at least the first time that you speak. No personal comments and all comments must be civil and respectful to the other members of the town meeting. We have a lot of local officials and other consultants in here and between myself and town council and the town clerk, we will try and get you all of your questions answered. For voting, I will try and do votes on a voice vote. If I can't, I may ask for a show of hands. If I still can't, figure out which side won, I will um, have the vote counted and I will point tellers for that purpose. If there is a question as to whether or not I counted fairly or accurately, seven members may stand and question that vote. I do respect a call of the question or a call to cut off debate. I don't like it, but if things go on and on and on, I will respect that. If I think it's premature or that there are people still standing at the mics that want to be heard, I'm going to let them be heard, but I, I do respect that if things are going uh, on a little long. I know we can complete this town meeting tonight. Um, I think there's a lot of important business, but I think we can get to the matters at hand. <coughs> With that in mind, we go straight to article number one. Mr. McDonough. Mr. Moderator. I vote to approve the transfer as is shown on the screen and in the handout. Mr. McDonough, explanation? Well, this is a routine article to transfer funds from free cash and to transfer corresponding amounts between budget lines. The full details of the transfer uh, is shown on the screen and in the handout. The primary transfer is from free cash at 250000 to the stabilization fund and add approximately $126,407 from certified free cash to various budget lines, including $129,201 from KP Regional Operating Budget and $1,200 from a fire department code violation for a total of $256,808 to various budget lines. Anyone have any questions or comments on Article 1? Mr. Hathaway. Uh, just to uh, not to, just to be clear, the uh, $250,000 is, is not shown on the screen, and it is in uh, Article 3. So that was, he was, Mr. McDonald was reading a summary of all the financial transfers. So, so just, we, just what's shown up here on the screen, Jack, then, right? Correct. Okay. Questions, comments, Article 1. Seeing none, this is a simple majority vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. It is unanimous. 
Article 2, unpaid bills. Mr. McDonough. Mr. Moderator, I move to indefinitely postpone Article 2. Okay. I assume because there are no? That is correct. There are no unpaid bills. Any questions or comments on Article 2? I'm going to make a motion. So then he's going to make it. He has to be the <laughs> No. I'm just going to do it. Seeing none, hearing none, all those in favor of indefinite postponement signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? It passes unanimous. Article 3, um, Mr. McDonough. For Article 3, first I would like to move to divide Article 3 into two parts. Okay, so that, that would be two different motions that uh, Mr. McDonough is going to make under it. That's a simple majority vote. I don't believe we require a, a debate on that. So all those in favor of dividing this into two separate motions, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, it is divided. Your first motion, Mr. McDonough. I move to approve the first set of transfers shown on the handout amounting to $532,269. And I assume that is exactly what is shown on the screen, Mr. McDonough? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Any further explanation on those, Mr. McDonough? No. Questions, comments on the first part here, right here. Can you, you have to come up to a mic, please? My name's Bill Hawkins from Union Street, and my question is on the Norfolk Elementary Building Study. I can, I think, assume why we're doing it. Is there a similar study that is forecasting what we think the needs will be? Because this seems to be what we could do if we had to. Mr. Hathaway. I think this will, this will be a combination of both. We're, so we're look, this is a joint effort between myself and, and Superintendent Nilardi. Uh, we're looking at the projections, growth projections in the town, and then looking at this, primarily looking at this building. This was a building that was built uh, as part of the model program. Uh, it has an ex, uh, expansion plan to it, and now we're going to ask the architects to, to look at that and see if that fits what our needs will be. Mr. Rosenberg. Um, David Rosenberg, 123 North Street. Um, I just would like an explanation for why the article was divided. That, that is what the motivation for dividing it is. Well, I think we, we are, we've already divided it. Uh, my guess is two different funding sources, but it, it's already divided. So um, any further questions on the first part here? Okay, so this requires a majority vote on motion number one with everything as shown on the screen. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? It is approved unanimously. Second motion, Mr. McDonough. Mr. Moderator, I move to approve $123,000 from the Water Reserve Fund for the purchase of a water department service vehicle and a tag along trailer for equipment as shown in the handout and on the screen. Any explanation here, Mr. McDonough? Uh, note the uh, water department needs a new uh, service vehicle, which is, um, if I recall, uh, a, like an F-250 uh, pickup truck and, um, and a trailer so they can transport some of their equipment when they're out working. And for Mr. Rosenberg's benefit, money coming out of the Water Enterprise Fund can only be used on expenses for the Water Enterprise. So that's why the, the segregation here. Um, Mr. Hathaway. I'm getting hand signals from the water department over on the, it's a F-550, Mr. McDonough. <laughs> Got to know your trucks a little bit better. I stand Steve. corrected. Yeah, that's right. Figure that one out. New chair, so he's, uh, you know, a little nervous. Um, <laughs> any further questions on the second motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? It passes unanimously. Article number four, with respect to the stabilization fund. Mr. McDonough. Mr. Moderator, I move to approve the transfer of $250,000 from free cash to the stabilization fund. Second, Mr. McDonough. The stabilization fund is considered one of the town's primary savings accounts. The state has certified our free cash at 1.5 million, and this article would approve the transfer of $250,000 into the stabilization fund. Any questions, comments on Article 4? 
Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? It passes unanimously. Article five is when we um, hear reports on matters affecting the town. Um, I was not alerted of any reports except for Mr. Lehan. Were we going to give a, a brief update on public safety buildings? Uh, I don't know if Mr. Cronin is here. He is chair. Um, I see him walking in there. Ah. Maybe, maybe you could warm us up a little bit, Mr. Lehan, and let everyone know what's going on. I'm sure. Well, as I think as most of you know, we're, the police station is under construction. Uh, it is, I would say, about ready to be closed in. The walls are about ready to be put together, if you will, so that they can work all winter long and complete the inside. The police station is made up of two components. It's going to be not only our police station, but it'll be a regional dispatch center, which is made up of Franklin, Plainville, Rentham, and Norfolk, um, which is separately funded by the state uh, for that part of the project. The fire station is now in the design phase. Uh, as you can tell, there's been some work uh, preparing for new bays that will go on the side that the church is on. There'll be, I believe, three new bays put on that side. That construction won't start until probably the spring of this upcoming year. Uh, but we're probably about 30 days behind our ideal schedule. Um, we had a couple of things that, that always happens on a new project that slowed us down a little bit, but uh, we're getting back on project time now. So it, it is going well, um, and we expect it to be about a year, I think, before the police station will be open. So, Mr. Cronin, did you want to add anything to that, sir? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> thank, uh, thank you Dave, very much. I'd be glad to take any questions if anyone has any. Uh, yeah. That's terrific. We'll look for a further update in the spring. And if you are on a board that meets and, and wants to give a report at our next town meeting, just let us know ahead of time and we'd be happy to carve out some time for you. I'm sure a town meeting would be glad to hear what all of our appointed boards are and elected boards are up to. Mr. Article Sir, just, Mr. Hathaway. I just, uh, I just wanted to thank actually uh, Dr. Lardy for allowing us to have the meeting here tonight. and. Uh, but especially Mr. Hafner, who's over there lugging chairs. Uh, Matt is our facilities director and uh, has done yeoman's work in working uh, to get this facility ready, along with NCTV in the back corner, Katie Woodham. So thank you, Katie, for doing your work. Thank you. And I, I have to thank everyone here for coming out, too, before we move on to Article 6 to, for a rainy December night to have this many folks out to a special town meeting is, is really terrific. Thank you very much for coming out. It is important. Um, article number six, it's acceptance of a statute. Mr. Frontzak. I move to approve article six as printed in the warrant. Mr. Frontzak, want to explain what this is? Yes, this comes from a language from the Massachusetts Municipal Modernization Act. Its intent is to create efficiencies by allowing the town treasurer to collect small tax bills in one bill and payment as opposed to dividing them into four throughout the year, which makes sense, we feel, only in larger amounts. Any questions, comments on Article 6? Seeing none, it is a majority vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? It passes unanimously. Article 7. Mr. Mr. Moderator, Frontier. I move to amend the general bylaws of the Town of Norfolk, Article 2, Section 4, Paragraph A, by deleting annually from the first sentence and replacing it with the word periodically and deleting the words, quote, for not less than a 12-month period, unquote, also from the first sentence so the paragraph reads as printed on the screen. So this, this bylaw is a, is a tool for um, helping us facilitate some collections and then we can use the licensing and permitting process, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, again, this comes from the same Municipal Improvement Act. The goal here is to reduce risk to both the town as well as citizens and taxpayers. Uh, if you have, say, uh, someone who's trying to conduct town business or pulling a permit who perhaps you're doing business with, uh, if there are situations that are in arrears, non-payment, uh, this allows the uh, treasurer to then engage with that situation earlier as opposed to waiting 12 months, an entire year, for taking any steps. Any questions or comments on Article 7? 
Sir, come on up to the mic. <clears throat> Hi, Jeff Berkner, Wampanoag. This doesn't match what's printed here or in the handout that we get at the table. Did I miss something? I'm, I'm sorry? Article 7, as shown on the screen, doesn't seem to match. This is the, the explanation of all of the changes that they are. The article itself, as I recall, was more of a, a broad brush as to merely updating our existing bylaw. And when myself and the town administrator and town council looked at it, we um, specificity as to the exact changes to the bylaw are required, but it is accomplishing the goal of that um, warrant article. So it's uh, within that scope. Legally what's printed there here on the on the paper and on the screen is equivalent what the, the the motion relates to these changes that are shown right there i i don't know what what you picked up on the on the table but that these are the changes to that first paragraph of our local bylaw any further questions or comments on article 7 this requires a majority vote. It is a general bylaw. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? It passes unanimously. Article 8, 9, and 10 are road acceptance articles. Mr. Tomaszewski. Mr. Moderator, I move that, um, or by, uh, I move that we accept the Article 8 as written in the warrant. By accepting this road as a public way, we increase the number of uh, eligible roads used to the calculation of the amount of uh, maintenance funds that we receive from the state under Chapter 90. So during the construction process, the road's not approved until it's done. Now that it's done, we accept it and we get monies from the state. For the benefit of town meeting, Mr. Tomaszewski, can you let us know um, where this road is, if you know? The first one um, is on uh, Castle Road. Thank you. This uh, will require a two-thirds vote. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Mr. Byron. Uh, Walter Byron, uh, Planning Board. The Planning Board sponsors this and the next two articles, and we did so after having received confirmation from the head of the DPW that the streets indeed have been inspected and have been built to the town requirements. Any further questions, comments on Article 8? Again, this requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? It passes unanimously. Article 9, Mr. Tomaszewski. Article 9 is similar to Article 8. This involves the uh, uh, Meeting House Road, and uh, again, the, the purpose of this is can you, can we, let's get the motion read first and then <coughs> I'm sorry the advisory committee recommends the approval of article 9 as written in the ward so I <coughs> hate to be a stickler but can you pose that in the form of a motion I, I move I just thought I did but anyhow uh, the advisory committee recommends the approval of article 9 as written in the warrant I move he moves the recommendation I move it too. <laughs> All right, I'm, go I'm gonna accept that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anyhow, again, the explanation is the same. Uh, by accepting road uh, that has been signed off by the DPW and uh, approved by the planning board, we now will get uh, chapter 90 funds from the state. And Mr. Byron, same comment here on this one. The planning board's reviewed this and finds the road acceptable? He did. All three, eight, nine, and 10, <coughs> terrific. Um, any further questions or comments on Article 9? Uh, Sir, come on up. I'm John Nuhibian from Three Knoll Drive. Uh, my question is, uh, does the later article, uh, which impacts the, the access to the credit union at the corner of Union and Meeting House Road, is that the street we're talking about? No, here? unrelated. This is up behind. Um, Past the condo. The condos, yeah. Thank the, you. The preserve. Thank you, sir. Yeah. 
Further comments, questions on Article 9? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? It passes unanimously. Article 10, Mr. Tomaszewski. I move to approve Article 10 as printed in the warrant. Third, third time's a charm. <laughs> the advisory committee approves, uh, recommends approval of this article as written in the warrant, and it's the same explanation as the last time. Now that the uh, this road is approved, and it's the road of um, Wild Holly Lane, uh, with this we'll get additional Chapter 90 monies. Thank you. Um, again, in that same uh, subdivision as, as well, right, Mr. Tomaszewski? I believe so, yes. Yeah. Any questions, comments on Article 10? Again, requires a two-thirds vote. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? It passes unanimously. Article 11, appointment of the town clerk. Ms. Joyce. Terrio. Mr. Moderator, I move to approve Article 11 as printed in the warrant. Second. Ms. Terrio. Thank you. Um, the feeling, this actually is supported by our present um, town clerk. It is um, of the opinion of the present town clerk and the advisory board that by allowing for an appointment of this position, we're able to get someone who has the expertise and the quali qualifications to carry out this position. Um, an elected position does not always offer um, a, a better candidate or an experienced candidate for the position. Thank you, Ms. Terrio. Mr. Hathaway. Uh, I would just echo Ms. Uh, Mrs. Terrio's comments. Uh, We've seen a lot of transition from elected to appointed positions in, in, in Norfolk uh, a few years ago, uh, but also in Franklin uh, and other neighboring towns. Uh, I think Carol would say that, uh, that it's not quite half, but it's approaching half for the number of town clerks. Um, but the amount of work they do is, uh, you know, in the old days, I think the clerk was kind of the, the clerk was kind of the, uh, you know, kept a few records uh, and wasn't a really detailed, you know, wasn't a really intense job. These days it's a very computer intense, um, it can be a very high volume at certain times, particularly certain times of the year, um, and the ability for us to go out and hire the best candidate, um, and I will be the first to tell you if we were going to hire somebody today, Carol would be the first one we would hire. Um, so it's not about, I don't want anybody to think it's about the person, this is about the job. Um, but in the future, if the position is open and Carol was not willing to do it, um, we would want to have the ability to hire the best available candidate and not be limited to a Norfolk resident who was willing to run a candidacy. Mention the finance. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hathaway. Does anyone have any questions or comments on Article 11? Sir, come on up. <coughs> Will this have any impact on the pay grade that uh, the job is warranted to hold? It, it would, uh, no, not just because of this <coughs> this decision, whether it's elected or appointed, that doesn't won't impact the pay grade. Further questions or comments on Article 11? Seeing none, this requires a majority vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Aye. The ayes have it by a clear majority. It does pass. <coughs> Article 12, Ms. Terrio. Mr. Moderator, I move to approve, artic to approve Article 12 as printed in the warrant. Second. Ms. Terrio. Uh, Mr. Moderator. The, um, the clerk is ask, the town clerk is asking for um, the open the Massachusetts open meeting laws um, 
boards and committees are required to maintain and record minutes. The town clerk, uh, the keeper of those records, is looking to have those minutes um, given to her for storage in a timely manner. So in, in other words, one stop shopping for those that are looking for the minutes of a board where it could be um, scattered elsewhere. And the remaining parts of this, I can just tell you, are more or less following new regulations by the state for keeping and creating minutes. Mr. Rosenberg. Um, as I understand it, the purpose of this is to make it easier for the town to satisfy the uh, schedule for municipal records retention. Um, the not retention, it's about creating. It's not a retention statute. There, there is a retention statute. There is. Um, and um, it says that um, the minutes of um, public bodies need to be retained permanently, and it also says that if um, there are drafts of the minutes that are substantially different from the approved version, that they also need to be uh, retained permanently. And so my question is whether um, the intention um, of this change is that both the um, approved minutes and um, draft minutes that are substantially different from the approved minutes um, will be um, requested by the town clerk in order to um, meet the retention schedule requirements. So, uh, so anyone else can jump in, but I'll, I'll answer to the best of my ability. The, this is under the open meeting law, and I think you're also referring to matters under the public records law. This is requiring the actual approved minutes to be kept by the town clerk. What drafts may be kept as public records would be up to each one of those separate boards. This is for the approved articles, and the public records law has uh, requirements for retention issues for specific drafts, whether those need to be kept or not, and that's kind of beyond what we're talking about here. This is just a requirement to have a central depository and that for them to be produced in a timely manner. So little apples and oranges. Riveting, right? <laughs> so I, I guess I, I really want to uh, understand this uh, fully. The, um, um, as, as I understood the motivation, it was so that there was one central place. You said you know, one-stop shopping. To keep the minutes. To keep um, minutes uh, because that is a requirement of the municipal records retention schedule. Um, not, the, it's not required that they be kept at the town clerk. That's, that's correct. It's, it's not required. It doesn't say where they need to be kept. It just says they need to be kept permanently. That's the public records law. That's not public and, records. and that same thing says, and drafts if they're substantially different from the approved minutes. Again, I'm not here to comment on a, a separate law. This is kind of a separate issue. This is just, I want to just keep debate on what's before the town meeting. I, I respect your question. And I know that you believe strongly in that in levels of transparency. I just think that's a, a different issue for a different day. Question. Moderator John Nuhibian, I have a question, actually a couple questions. One is, it refers to the state of Massachusetts, should it not say Commonwealth of Massachusetts, open meeting law, and also uh, the reference to a timely manner is a bit vague. I wonder if that should be quantified to some degree. Well, and I'll, I can perhaps let someone else mention this too, the, the state regulations have a certain time periods within them for when you have to do, and this is just supposed to capture those. My a concern that I would have is that if they change the regulation and it's more strict than what we have in a bylaw, you have to vote on it again. So that's why it allows us to change with as the state changes their rules. These are state rules, and we're just trying to ma make sure we're following their rules. Um, and probably should say Commonwealth. I, I, I don't think anyone's going to say it's unenforceable. Thank you, sir. I mean, if you wanted to make a friendly amendment, I, I would accept that friendly amendment. I'll make a friendly amendment, okay. sir. I will accept that friendly amendment without the need for a vote to change state to uh, Commonwealth. I'm, I'm assuming no one has an objection to that. Mm -hmm. Second, though. Second. Here we go. Um, I, will, I will accept that. Any further questions? Mr. Byron. 
Uh, if this is if this article is adopted, um, is this going forward or does it have a retroactive period? And if so, how far back? Actually, um, I've already collected um, all the boards and committees. Um, I've become, uh, we've been working on this for the past year, um, collecting all the boards and committees one by one. So I, I currently have most everybody's. Um, we're just trying to make this going forward that it's it's in the bylaws so that we have something that, that says that the boards do have to file with me and that they're permanent, they're, they're signed minutes. How far back did you go? As far back as people had records. I got, um, um, it depends on the boards, I got some stuff that goes back to the 50s. Thank you. Mr. Gilliland. Hi, Ross Gilliland on Chickadee Drive. Um, I had a question about the ambiguity of um, um, timely as well, but accurate and original signed I was confused by. So I'm just wondering Not to obvious. what detail is accurate and if that's in the original statute then that's fine. If that there's certain criteria, is it just we met at this time, we adjourned and these were the motions and or is there other things that make it accurate? And then what is original signed versus approved or yeah, approved by the board? Original signed is approved. Uh, when it, they're taken to the board, when they're taken to the board and they're approved by the board, and then they're signed at the meetings, those are the ones that I need. Those are the ones that are permanent record, not so is, photocopies. Is, so there's the difference. I don't want photocopies. Um, the original signed minutes are what is. Permanent so having record. been a chair of the school committee at one point, yep. we would vote to approve usually at the next meeting. Yep. But I never signed anything. The like clerk the clerk, them. The, the clerk signs them. Okay, so, and all that's out in the statute. So when you say signed, it's the approved, signed by the meeting taker? Yeah, the, the clerk. The clerk will sign them when they're approved. And then those are the ones that come to me. So on smaller boards, they don't necessarily always have, they might have a, do, who's gonna take minutes? They're required by law to take okay. minutes. So it's and just, that's, this is and that's the part about, that. in accordance yes. with the statute. They have yes. to follow the statute yes. now. Okay. Um, it, it's to keep, you know, just can't be who wants the, to take minutes today. And it, it's to get the smaller boards to, you know, okay. to take minutes, right, to take you. accurate minutes. Uh, and the, the, just <laughs> let me address your other thing when you said about the uh, the timely Accuracy. manner. The reason that we put timely manner is some boards, some of the small boards only meet a couple times a year. Right. So for them, it's six months for, you know, the And that's the boards, intent is board. the board meets at some point exactly. to approve the minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's a timely and what, manner. Just is accuracy like what level of detail needs to be in there? Like some minutes are very vague. Like, I mean, is there a certain that's standard? all captured by by law by open meeting law? So would you approve? Like this was an acceptable? I don't. I, I don't. I don't approve or disapprove anybody's minutes. I don't. Um, they need to follow the open meeting law. Okay. That's that's. And you're just going to serve as the custodian. I'm just the custodian, and I think that'll be a big help. Thank you. Thanks. And I, I, will, I will say, uh, Mr. Gilliland. Uh, all those years ago when you served on the school committee, the, the open meeting law has changed significantly since then and the requirement for um, lengthier or more detailed minutes is captured within the new amendments to the open meeting law. So there's a, a little bit more detail under, under the law itself. Any further questions on Article 12? This is does require a majority vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? It passes unanimously. Article 13, the stretch energy code. Mr. Sneed. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I am moved to approve Article 13 as, a plen as printed in the warrant. Seconded. Mr. Sneed, any explanation here? Uh, yes, although I will leave the details to the experts. Uh, this is, as many of you who've been here for prior meetings over the years, is the stretch energy code that we have voted down uh, at least two or three times. Uh, the primary concern expressed at the last round was that the stretch energy code applied to uh, renovations, additions to a house, so that if you have a 50-year-old house and you're doing something substantial, you could incur significant cost uh, meeting the stretch energy code. The state law has now been changed so that um, those conditions are no longer required so that if you're renovating, you're not, you do not have to meet stretch energy. Uh, and on that basis, um, we voted in favor of the stretch energy code, and I believe our vote was unanimous in favor of it. Uh, and I know we have several experts here um, that are much more knowledgeable than I, and I believe they will uh, be able to answer questions. 
So I believe the Energy Committee, um, Mr. Sullivan, you're, you have a PowerPoint presentation you're going to walk us through. So come on up to the mic and do what you're going to do. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Larry Sullivan, uh, Three Mile Goes Way. And uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. This is, uh, this is important. I know you know that. Um, and I just wanted to thank you personally for coming out. Um, There's a request that you speak up a little oh, bit, sorry. sorry. Okay, is that better? Okay. The stretch code is an amendment to the Massachusetts Building Code and focuses on energy efficiency and may be adopted at town meeting by any of the 351 communities in Massachusetts. The stretch code applies to new residential construction and new commercial construction that is greater than 100,000 square feet or is greater than 40,000 square feet and is a high energy consuming building like a refrigerated storage building at a supermarket. The stretch code does not apply to renovations or additions. There are five criteria that must be satisfied from Ma the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources, DOER, to grant green community status to a Massachusetts town. The remaining criterion to be satisfied by Norfolk is adoption of the stretch code. Designation of green community status by DOER will result in a designation grant of approximately $140,000 being awarded to Norfolk. Subsequent to the designation grant award, Norfolk will be eligible on an annual basis to apply for project grants from DOER. Such project grants can be in the amount of up to $250,000 each. This is obviously a map of Massachusetts. It shows highlighted the communities within the state that have already adopted the stretch code. As of today, there are 215 Massachusetts communities that have adopted the stretch code. In September, that number was 207, as shown on this slide. Eight more communities, including Franklin, have adopted the stretch code just since September. <coughs> of the 215 communities that have adopted the stretch code, 185 have gone on to be designated as green communities by DOER. If the stretch code is adopted by Norfolk tonight, it will become effective on July 1st, 2018. DOER hired an independent building energy consultant, ICF International, out of Washington, D.C., to evaluate the cost benefit of implementing the stretch code in new residential construction. ICF has been around since 1969. They have 5,000 energy professionals engaged in various energy-related fields. The model home that ICF evaluated was a, a 2,550-square-foot, three-bedroom, single-family home. ICF evaluated using natural gas, propane, oil, and electric heat pump as the energy sources for the model home. They considered a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage at 4% APR with a 10% down payment. Every model evaluated resulted in the homeowner seeing a positive cash flow from day one after purchasing a stretch code home versus a base code compliant one. Every model in every year was cash positive for the homeowner. The capital cost impact was between $2,600 and $4,000 without rebates from MassSave. The capital cost impact with rebates was between $1,000 and $2,400. In all cases, the capital cost impact was between one quarter and one half percent of the capital cost, the total capital cost of the home. And all of those costs are absorbed by the reduced energy costs that come with a stretch code home. Over $79 million has been awarded by DOER to green communities in Massachusetts. $35 million of that uh, was in designation grants. The balance was in project grants. DOER's annual budget for green community grants 
is $20 million a year. Let's look at the experience of some of our neighboring towns that are in the Green Community Program. Medfield, they just became green this year. They received a $146,000 designation grant. Medway became green in 2011, and they've received $580,000 thus far, and that includes money for their designation grant as well as two project grants. Millis became green last year, and they got a $151,000 designation grant. Westwood, five years in the program, they've received $630,000 from DOE, and that includes money for their designation grant as well as two project grants. And finally, Holliston received uh, $394,000 for their designation grant and one project grant. They became green in 2015. The concept of the green community was first introduced in Norfolk in 2009. The lost opportunity of not having adopted the stretch code and subsequently obtaining green community status has cost the town of Norfolk hundreds of thousands of dollars. You just saw the numbers from some of our neighboring towns that are in the Green Community Program. Tonight we have the opportunity to remedy the situation in Norfolk. And it's up to all of us now to do that, to do just that. Thank you. over there no idea <laughs> um, there are people with technical expertise I, I, I I'm happy to call upon them if, if we need to but I'd rather have if some folks have some questions or some comments and want to come up to the mics please do so now sir Uh, Thomas Norton, 31 Priscilla Ave. Uh, I'm a remodeling contractor and a small builder, and um, I do know the energy code quite well and the stretch code, which we don't actually build to the stretch code because we haven't adopted it, but we actually build to the updated code, which was implemented, I believe, on January 1st, which is actually the same building code now as a stretch code, and it will get updated again to what's called an energy efficiency code later, which I do not know that date, but it will upgrade again. Uh, today's presentation by the Energy Committee uh, showed us what we could get from the state regarding this, but I do believe that they have left out any uh, pertinent information to show you what they will do with that money and what it will cost us. So <clears throat> some requirements to consider, I believe, looking at the websites for the state, that we have to have fleet upgrades to the town, fleet upgrades to the town for the vehicles, right? Well, so Tom, Tom if, you, if you have a question, Bring it through us, and if, okay. if we need to get it answered, it will. Right, so I just don't want discussion going back and forth. upgrades to the town. Yeah, maybe just a little up a little higher. Lead Thanks. upgrades to, to the town. Uh, town-owned property buildings must have a 20% increase to their heating systems and all energy systems lighting. Uh, how do the rebates from the state compare to the costs associated with the upgrades? Has a study been done to show what the upgrades would cost versus what the money available to the town is? And also... What is the issue with the solar fields and zoning, which I believe the town does not have as much control over solar fields, which there's an issue in Beverly now, which is a community, which a stretch code, and it was in the news tonight that they have an issue with a neighborhood problem with a solar field placed in someone's yard, which was not run through a town board because they lost control over that. Um, and this does affect new homes to the point where all the heat recovery must be done on all the bathroom fans, and that system costs $5,000 to put one of those in. And we now would have to hire a consultant to run the HERS rating, and that is an added cost. So I'd like to have those questions answered. But 
before we have those questions answered, I, I think somebody over there was taking notes on them, on, on those. Did, did I see that right? But I think we have someone else at the mic. Yes. Go. Sure. Hi. Go. Jennifer Wynn, Hemlock Lane. Can everyone hear, hear me okay? Um, I have to admit, I, I've heard comments um, prior to this on both sides, so I have some questions. I think we can all agree on the surface, energy um, is definitely something that we should all conserve. My question, though, is I've heard that this could cost um, commercial, anyone commercial um, building or private building, residential building, up to 3 to 5% on the building. So why should, considering we're a town that's trying to get more commercial business in here to reduce our tax rate burden that's on the residences, um, why is it going to be a deterrent for commercial real estate to come in here if they have to pay additional monies to go for this green code where I believe that Rentham and Plainville do not have have adopt they have not adopted the stretch code so could it be a potential deterrent um, with that so um, whether it's a deterrent or not isn't particularly a technical question but as to increased um, costs that I think Mr. Norton and Ms. Wynn um, had I think Larry did you did you say you have someone here that can help answer questions is that right Yes. All right, so it, I will allow someone, you know, who is not a, a resident, if you can introduce yourself to our town meeting, welcome. And if you could just stick to the questions here, we're not uh, interested in the advocacy piece, that's for us, but the technical side of it, I'm okay with. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Jim Berry. I work for the Department of Energy Resources. I live in the town of Belchertown. In 2008, I was a member of the Board of Selectmen in Belchertown when the Green Communities Program was created, so I started investigating it to see if it would work for us. As a result of my investigation and my knowledge of it, they decided to hire me and ask me to go around and help explain things to other selectmen throughout uh, Massachusetts. So I work for the state. I work for you. I, pay, I get paid from the same bucket of money that these grants come out of, which is the Reg Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative funds. It's not the standard budget. It's a separate budget pile of money. Um, I may not have gotten all the questions exactly right, but I'm, I, what I wrote down was a concern about a fleet upgrade if you become a green community. There are five requirements to become a green community. They are written into the legislation. It's not something that DOAR made up. It's your state reps and your state senators wrote the law. There are five criteria, one of which says the selectman must pass a fuel efficient vehicle policy, which says in the future, if we procure vehicles, we will procure fuel efficient vehicles whenever they are available and practicable. So we do not require snow plows on a Prius. If you buy a huge truck and put a snow plow on it, that's exempt. It doesn't have to be fuel efficient. If you buy a high speed cruiser, that does not have to be a efficient high speed cruiser. If you buy a fire truck, it just does not have to be efficient high speed, high miles per gallon. So. Generally speaking, for cities that have a fleet of other cars, for Prince, for instance, the um, fire deputy that goes from school with the sparky hats, if you procure another vehicle for that person, we'd want it to be fuel efficient. So it doesn't require you to replace anything in the existing fleet. It just says that going forward, we will be smart about the vehicles we do procure. Um, another concern was we must require a 20% upgrade of our buildings. One of the cr three criteria says, as a town, we're going to try to be a little bit more aware of the energy that we use in our municipal buildings. So we require that the, the law requires that you get your arms around all the energy you use in each of your buildings. You add up the electricity you use in the buildings, the oil heat, the gas heat, the diesel fuel, add them all up, put them into a software program we help you get. It adds all up that number and gets a great big MMBTUs of what we use in a given year. And then we ask you to come up with a plan to reduce that whole number by 20% over five years. We don't require that town meeting pass the money to accommodate that plan. We just ask that you have a reasonable plan, which usually requires, usually most selectmen think about doing anyway, how could we save money on buildings by having it more energy efficient? Quite often you have a no cost 
energy assessment done by a utility company and they give you a list of things you can do such as lights such as heating systems such as more insulation in the b d p w building perhaps more replace old garage doors in a building that are leaking so we ask you to come up with a plan to reduce the energy by twenty percent we don't require that you fund it in fact our grants generally are what fund those plans so if you become a green community you're eligible for funds most towns use those funds to execute a plan they start saving electricity they start saving oil which means your tax dollars go for something besides electricity and oil like perhaps salt um, another question was related to solar fields I believe there is some concern sometimes that if you become a green community must we allow solar fields everywhere with no no connections whatsoever the answer is no we do ask that some place in town not every place in town your zoning bylaw allows for some kinds of renewable energy or alternative energy activities without a special permit many towns meet that through a um, industrial zone if you're trying to encourage industry if you happen to have an industrial zone that allows for research and development or small-scale manufacturing without special permit if you already have that then you probably already meet the green community's requirement if you have absolutely nothing I live out in the western part of the state many towns don't have any zoning except residential and what some of them have done is said passed a zoning bylaw which requires two-thirds vote by this body it's not happening tonight so you have another shot a bite at the apple if you don't like it but some towns vote to have a solar bylaw that says if we have town owned property we will allow solar bylaw by right not by special permit which means our requirement of the zoning has changed but you still maintain control over it because you own the property so nothing's going to happen without your approval so the solar thing is sometimes a concern but um, if you just read the regulations and just read the state the law it's not always clear what it means um, I suggest there's um, for each one of the five criteria there's a, a whole guidance document that explains in layman's terms and in a narrative what the requirements are um, another concern was must have a HERS rating for the new uh, construction that was that one of your concerns sir yes sure so the, the, the basic difference between the stretch code built home in a non stretch code built home is to meet the stretch code requirements you have to have a HERS number associated with the house that has to come from a HERS expert that you have to hire so whoever's building the house has to hire one more subcontractor like you hire a plumbing subcontractor an electrical subcontractor an insulation subcontractor now you have to hire an energy intelligent subcontractor to help you design the house will come out and do some of the inspections instead of or in addition to the building inspector to guarantee that the house is in fact energy efficient they do a blower door test when it's all done they give you a specific number for your house so it's like in miles per gallon for your house when you go to sell it you can say I got a 45 and it's better than year 66 or whatever those numbers might be in the future um, it's interesting to note that in July of 2014 the standard building code was changed to also require blower door test duct tightness test and as of July 1 of 2017 your town requires a HERS rater to do that blower door test so yes the stretch code requires a bit more it's a bit of a stretch that's what I call it, a stretch code it's a standard building code it's energy efficiency it's a bit of a stretch and five years ago it was quite a bit of a stretch because the old building code was less stringent but the standard building code has evolved and caught up to it which is why we now say it's not much of a stretch anymore you still you do need a HERS rater you have to pay extra for that HERS rater but the HERS rater is very familiar with the mass save rebate program which they can receive money from that helps pay for their own invoice and commercial I think was the, was the, was the last issue um, so I, uh, I just want to read to you the stretch code used to be like seven or eight pages long until July when they made it less than one page long and for commercial code it says uh, all buildings over 100,000 square feet and new supermarkets laboratories and conditioned warehouses over 40,000 square feet have to be 10 percent more energy efficient than ASHRAE level 90.1 appendix G per foot whatever the heck that means so it does mean that large commercial buildings are more energy efficient than standard but commercial buildings of this type that uh, medical commercial buildings uh, 
office commercial buildings it's very simple for them to beat the standard code just by putting l e d lights everywhere i will tell you that in terms of competitiveness when the concerns we had was if one town meets to stretch code in the other count town doesn't well all the builders go to the other town because it's easier to get there turns out it didn't happen turns out that many builders find that buyers want the miles per gallon rating on the house to hers rater they like the stretch code Boston has seen a boom in building in commercial to the point where their vacancy rate is way down, even though Boston was one of the first cities to have the stretch code, and it impacted all commercial buildings the first few years it was involved. It's only recently that it's been reduced in requirements. I'm not sure. I, Ms. Ms. Mater, I think I got... I, I think that captured a, li uh, a bit. Um, Mr. Norton, did uh, he respond to all your questions? Do you, did you have any follow-up? If, if you... Those are accessory, and there's some Dover Amendment protection for that, too, kind of a, a separate issue, Mr. Norton, so. No. I, I mean, I, I think there, solar, is, 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 uh, as as town council Mr. Uh, DeLuca could attest, is kind of a, a bit of a bear for us to work with because some of the other protections they have under zoning, there is some somewhat new favorable case law in terms of lo if we locate commercial size solar in certain districts the towns do have some freedom that they didn't used to have but that's tied up in a somewhat different issue mr norton yeah tom if if you want to just if you have a follow-up question if you want to just jump up to the mic i'm happy to have you answer a follow-up thank you you answered the question my question completely i have one more follow-up question or if we could let, let's yep. let Tom, go sure, first, and then Jen, you can go. Yep. Tom, if you um, had a follow-up. Yeah, well, my question is on a solar field place in a res residential property. Right now, the town boards have so, and I think the right to hear that application yeah. and to deal with it at their level. And the I, need, I need a clarification, if I'm right or wrong, that if we adopt a stretch code, that we, we lose that ability. So that's the question. Do we lose that ability to monitor that and be able to vote on it? And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let the gentleman answer the question. I will submit to you as a matter of zoning. We don't have a lot as much authority as we'd like. I, I will say so that just because of the protections they get under the Zoning Act. That's different. The short story is the stretch code has nothing to do with zoning. So saying yes or no to the stretch code has nothing to do with to make zoning better or worse. What you're voting on tonight is irrelevant to solar and to zoning. That may very well be another topic for another town meeting on do we do solar or not do solar and how do we do solar, but that's tonight you're being asked to vote on the stretch code. Thank you. Ms. Wynn, you had a follow-up? Yes. Um, my question is to the advisory board, will 40B developments be allowed to request a waiver of adopting the stretch code? And if so, if that is a yes, my opinion is that is going to be extremely desirable for builders to come in and um, do a 40B development versus a regular development. So let, let me give you my perspective on this because I did a bit of research on this because I certainly saw, I've seen comments on both sides of this. And so it's a yes, 40B will be allowed to be so waived? it's not a yes, okay. but it's, it's more complicated than that. As, as many of you know, I happen to do a lot of 40B work for the towns that I represent. There are agencies, state agencies, that suggest because the stretch code is linked to the building code that it is not waivable um, under 40B because 40B can only waive local requirements. There are other state agencies, including the state agency that runs 40B, that might beg to differ. So there is no legal cases, and I did that research again today. There are no cases, so the answer is we don't know. My practical experience is that I haven't seen a developer shy away from the stretch code or any other increased building requirements that come from it, but that's not to say that they wouldn't, but the zoning board also doesn't have to say yes to that either. They would have, they could make the developer prove that it would make the project uneconomic. So the, the, I think the short answer is we don't know and but uh, 
the best case scenario is that they can't waive it. Worst case scenario is there, there would at least be a debate over it at the local level at the zoning board. Thank you. You're welcome. Right, right here, question, and then we'll go over there. Melissa Franzak, 14 Main Street. Um, in the presentation, it talks about positive cash flow. Could you say a few more words on that? Is that related to the capital investment of putting it in is paid for by the energy savings year one and subsequent years? Larry, if you can uh, step to the mic, if you have an answer to that question. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's an economic analysis over the life of the mortgage, that's right. You, you, you characterized it correctly. Question here and, and then uh, Mr. Lutz after that. Hi, I'm Christina, 176 North Street. I'm just gonna carry this so I'm not hunching over. Um, I just wanted to make a comment that the past three and a half years I've worked with the DOER and held green communities and um, I think it's important for everybody to consider that we're all paying renewable energy and energy efficiency surcharges, which makes up on average maybe 8% of our utility bill. So if we don't take advantage of this, we're just going to keep continuing to pay for Millis High School and all these other communities to go solar, save money, use the grants. So, you know, if we don't use it, we lose it. Um, I think it's great. I've, you know, recently, and I, this is the last thing I'll say, I know it's not a solar conversation, but I've helped hundreds of families, and they're the same exact grants that, you know, could help us potentially do projects and renovations that will only save us money. Um, I don't think burning fossil fuels and paying an always increasing, never ending electric bill will help get us anywhere. So I hope everybody supports this stretch code. I think it's really important for the town. Mr. Lutz? Mr. L if I could get Mr. Lutz first. And then Mr. Dooley next. Um, I wanted to comment on what uh, Mr. Tallerman said about uh, the stretch code and 40B. Is uh, I spoke to the, um, I, I work for the Department of Energy Resources. I don't know if that disqualifies me from speaking here or not. But it does not. Uh, I live in town, uh, 15 Pondview Road. Um, the BBRS, the Board of Building Regulations and Standards, and the Department of Energy Resources both believe that when a town adopts the stretch code, they are adopting a state regulation and therefore 40B cannot override that. Um, I spoke with Mr. Tallerman about that today. Um, his comment, and it's legitimate, is that it's never been challenged in court. So there is, but there have been tens of, if not, there's been tens of 40Bs who have had to comply with the stretch code in, an, in all 250, 215 towns um, they've all complied, um, rather than take it to court. So that would be my comment. Mr. Dooley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sean Dooley, 11 Wright Farm Road. Um, let me first say, before I get into, into my comments, I'm a firm believer in green energy, um, so much so that I don't just like having government impose regulations on everyone else. I put my money where my mouth is. I built a new house. I achieved t tier three status. I put in geothermal. I put in solar. Uh, you know, I just had an 18,000 kilowatt hour uh, solar system installed. Uh, did all foam and everything like that. So for a tune of a roughly $150,000 um, to my own personal home um, in order to be fully off the grid because I believe in that. That being said, I do not believe that bigger government and more regulations and more control are what's right for Norfolk. I'm a firm believer that right now, Norfolk, we have a horrible commercial tax base, as Ms. Wynn had uh, pointed out earlier. In order to be able to recruit commercial development, we need to be as competitive as possible. And when we're competing against Rentham, which is the next town over that doesn't have this, and it's a 3% or 5% or, or whatever percentage cost is greater, that puts us at a competitive disadvantage. The reality is Norfolk is, has a reputation whether deserved or not, it has a reputation on builders and developers I've spoke with across the state of being a very, very difficult town to build in and to work with. I met with, uh, earlier this week, I, have, I was trying to recruit a uh, developer who does um, high-end nursing homes and assisted living facilities where it's a ringed-in facility to come to the town um, to actually look at the, uh, through the archdiocese, the uh, old, old uh, Ponville, Ponville Hospital uh, site and he said, you know what, I've worked in Norfolk before, I'm not gonna work there again. It's too difficult, I'm not going to do it. 
So I'm having him look at a piece of property down in Plainville because he's like, I'd be happy to look in Plainville. So those are the sort of things that we're up against. And I think we need to make sure that we do not put ourselves at a competitive disadvantage. Um, I will disagree with Mr. Lutz and Mr. Tallerman from the standpoint of uh, the development of 40Bs. Um, I believe that it can be waived. I actually spoke I, with- for, for the record, Mr. Dooley, I, I didn't have a commitment either way. I okay. said it was okay. an open question. Okay, I, I, I don't believe it's an open question. I, I'm sure so we could find something to disagree on, but uh, I, that isn't it. Okay, all right. So, <laughs> <laughs> we probably won't have to wait that long, but. Um, I can assure you that's the case. Uh, I spoke with Roberto Rubin, uh, who is the chief counsel of DHCD. Uh, she said she is 100% confident that it can be waived because it is a more restrictive code. I then spoke with Greg Watson of Mass Housing, and he stated that this position is shared by all subsidizing agencies. Um, so while it hasn't been challenged, um, the people that are running 40Bs believe that it is a waivable situation. So I worry that this will create uh, any new developers that are coming into town, they will have the ability to say, all right, I can either do this you know, it, it's a difficult town. I want to waive a lot of these other restrictions as well anyways, so it makes it easier. I might as well go with 40B and have an increased density and not worry about the setbacks and all the other uh, town zoning bylaws. And this is just another check on the box. Um, and I guess my final thing is, it's horrible for me to say as a politician, but I don't trust the politicians. Um, Additions and remodels were part of the original stretch code. Um, it was taken out because a lot of people were pushing back that they didn't want to, you know, I don't want to vote for this in my own town um, if it's going to affect me when I do a remodel or I do an addition or I do a 25% improvement. I, it got taken out. I am worried personally that it will get put back in. It doesn't affect my personal house because I've already well way in beyond, above and beyond the stretch code, but in the future, the politicians on Beacon Hill, once a, a large number of towns have got this and it's going forward and everything along those lines and they're like, Where, what else can we do to create an additional uh, impact, environmental impact, I'm afraid that that particular portion will be changed again in the future. So that is one of my own personal, you know, maybe it's my conspiracy theory, um, but I've, I've seen uh, government do that in the past and I, I don't necessarily uh, put it um, past them to do it in the future. All right. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Welcome. Mr. Bragan. Yes. Scott Bragdon, 12 Fredrickson Road. Uh, I guess my comment is, uh, or question is, uh, on the 40 Bs, uh, as everybody knows, we've got a ton that some have been approved, some are in the process of being approved, some are in the planning stages. Are, is the state going to come back and say, well, these are already in, in process, so you can't force them to do the stretch code. I mean, I guess that's my... That, that's not how 40B works. Uh, an applicant... It's worked on some other things that we've worked on in but town. But that, that, that wouldn't be how it would apply. Uh, if a developer has to follow all the rules unless the zoning board expressly waives a local requirement. So even if it is waivable, and, and I think the jury's out on that question, conspiracy theories uh, aside on that, I think that the that doesn't happen automatically. I want people to understand that. And I don't know what the end result of that could be, but a developer would have to come back to the zoning board and say, I want you to waive your stretch code. So if we have a 40B that's already been approved, and we have some, we can go back to them if we approve this and say, you must follow this, even though it's already been approved. Uh, up until the day they receive a building permit. There's no grandfathering. Thank you. I think, um, I don't know, John, if Andy, um, well, Jen, if we could have maybe someone new first, Andy. Jen, all right, so if we can get. Tired of me, Jay? I'm not, I just wanna get, make sure everyone gets uh, um, a chance before we So repeat. my understanding is that bylaws can be waived, correct? Under a 40B. They can be requested to be waived. A request, waived. correct. So here's my, so that's my question and here's my comment. It's great that past towns have not had the experience of having 40Bs um, not request a waiver. However, I have, this is not a conspiracy, Jay. I've sat in numerous ZBA meetings, and the, in my opinion, the waivers that have been requested have been enormous. And there's no doubt in my mind that at some point this will be waived. I, well, so, and I understand it doesn't really exactly meet the criteria of this 
article right now, but I'm just saying that that is one unfortunate deterrent, I, I think the that comment, it can't be waived. Don't, don't get me wrong. I think the comment and the open question on that issue is, is relevant. I am not diminishing the comment or the question on it. We are starting to get a little far afield on that. I just want to, for people on both sides of that divide, on waivable or not waivable, no one knows. Because I got, as Mr. Dooley pointed out, as Mr. Lutz pointed out, as some comments over here pointed out, we got agencies that are going to war with each other over it. So it's a legitimate question yeah. and, and a fair one. So heard and loud and clear and a relevant one. So, right. and I because thank you some for of these waivers up. are just as egregious to the environment as promoting a stretch code. Don't, don't disagree. Mr. Bakanowski. Andy Bakanowski, Naugatuck Avenue. Um, actually, I printed out the one paragraph for waivers from the 40B. The last sentence says, no waiver shall be made if it conflicts with any mandatory provision of any statute. So that's, that's my take on it. It lists what all the other waivers are, and they're all relative to the 40B. So I, I, I don't think there's an exact answer, but what this tells me is that if it doesn't have to do with 40B and it doesn't relate to zoning, it's not waivable. Um, for Mr. Norton, um, Amazon has heat recovery Panasonic units for $9.99, um, not $5,000. I've put two of these in at a home up north, and they work phenomenal. Um, when I was looking at them, never found anything over $1,500, so I, I have to question your cost on that. Um, regarding zoning for solar, we already did that for the landfill. That's already been in place. We already did the vehicle policy five years ago. That's, that was done. So. We're, we're much farther ahead than people are thinking. Thank you. Um, Larry, unless you're answering a question, I'd, I'd rather hear from the, um, no. the lady behind you. Just, a, just first an, time an to opinion. the mic. What's that? Just an opinion. Why don't we hear from someone else first? I, I want to round out, round out some commentary here. And then Mr. Weddleton Hi. next. Hi, Kathy Cubitt, Cleveland, next door to a 40B. Um, I'd just like to make mention in regards to the stretch code in the future, um, as this lady talked about for it being a positive for our community. Um, I can understand that a competitive edge is important, but time is moving forward. And I've seen many communities where older homes are raised to the ground and new builds are going up. Those new builds would be, you know, energy efficient and meeting the current building codes. Um, so when it comes to looking ahead and what's good for our town, I'd like to think that we're progressive and that we're looking towards the future to be more energy efficient and be part and parcel of a positive thing instead of just the same old mill of trying to find a competitive edge against our neighbors. A lot of our neighbors are green communities now. They're surrounding us. Um, I don't necessarily believe that means companies and business are going to come rushing into Norfolk just because we're not a green community. I think green community and the green designation has become a far greater positive thing than it had been 10 years ago. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton. Uh, John Weddleton, Seven Trail Sideway. Uh, I am on the Planning Board and the Conservation Commission. I've been in town for 15 years, and for approximately the past nine years, I build homes to the stretch code and not to the stretch code. And I will leave it at the simple fact, at what I see by paying the bills, a lot of the information that I have heard about cost, et cetera, I vehemently disagree with. Question is, we have a town council up there, we have a moderator who is also a town council, <coughs> By right, when a 40B, which is crucial because on the planning board, as we die heartedly try to save people's neighborhoods from the overwhelming 40Bs, 40Bs come and generally ask to waive every single bylaw that is automatic instead of the other program. Uh, Mr. Town Council, is there anything in the hey, law? John, if you have a question, give right, it to me. Mr. And moderator, I... for Mr. Coun Town Council, <laughs> is there anything in the law written now that exemplary? includes the stretch code bylaw that we're about to vote on and bypasses uh, 
the uh, waiver effective of 40B. So the, the, I'll just answer that. As I said before, no. There is nothing in law that prevents Either them from way. doing that. Is there a regulation that prevents them from doing that? So your, your skills at cross-examination belie your experience Thank you. Your, Thank uh, you. So my, my, my last So the, the, let me just, I want to just right. put the 40B question to, to rest. I think it's an important question. Right. I think a lot of people have had a lot of good comments on it. I think what you've heard is that no one knows what the effect of a request from a waiver would Very be. If, if I were representing a zoning board, I'd tell them to be stingy on, on it, but no one knows. So, uh, and that's a fair point, John, and I think you're bringing Thank that you. home. If you have something else, let's get into that, because I think we're two short the things. I have the same feelings on the, zo uh, the uh, ground field solar by right. In the planning board, every ground field solar we have is placed purposely to affect the neighbor's view and not the person asking and getting the benefit. We, by special permit, can farm that to let the, na the person getting the benefit be responsible for the lack of their view and protect it with landscaping. And uh, I think with all of these substantial questions, but this is so crucial, I'd like to offer a motion to IP this until we have more time to find out answers to all these questions that affect everything. So, it, hold on, hold on, hold on. He's entitled to make uh, a motion. I assume that you um, want to amend the main motion. Yes, I would, yes. So, this would be a motion to amend the main motion by substituting it with a motion for indefinite postponement, which would kill it. So, just to amend it, that is a majority vote that we would have to take in order to see if we are amending it. Does anyone have any, so that motion's been made, so before we get into additional comments on the main motion, does any, and I wanna have brief discussion, if anyone has any brief comments on the motion to amend only residential, uh, a residence. Sir, are you a resident? Yes, James Wilkinson, Village Green. Just on the motion to amend? Yes. On the, with regard to the motion to amend and the basis stated for the motion to amend that we don't know enough about the stretch code and therefore we should indefinitely postpone the vote. This same argument was made three years ago and it was indefinitely postponed at that time. Since that time, we've brought to the town uh, a vast amount of information, answered all of the town's questions, and to indefinitely postpone it again on the same ruse that we just don't know enough about it would be a disservice to Norfolk. Okay. Thank you. All right. I, I, don't, I, I do not want to spend all night on this, so if we can hold on the applause, I, I respect everyone's zeal on this. Anything else on the motion to amend only? So I want to get to a vote on that. Do you have a... Come on up to the mic. Just on the motion to amend. Yep, got it. Uh, Ralph Gregg's uh, Shady Way. So we hear about uh, the grants and some of the money uh, and where it might be directed and so forth. And I guess the one thing I haven't heard that concerns me a little bit is there are requirements uh, tied. I think, I think you're beyond the motion to I'm amend. Not, all right, let me just let me be very succinct. My concern is that we don't know the costs associated with doing the things necessary for the various requirements to receive the grants. So we know the income, but we don't know the outgo. So that concerns me, and that's why uh, I'm interested in uh, the, the postponement, truly postponement as opposed to indefinite. Okay. So being <coughs> no one else on, on, at the mic, Jeff, did you have uh, Mr. Palumbo, Selectman Palumbo? <laughs> Just on the motion to amend. Yeah, I mean, given that motion was made and there was reference to some of the very divisive situations which we have come across, I was previously on the planning board and involved in some of these situations where the special permit process was integral in terms of trying to mitigate situations where uh, solar panels were put at the property line or very close to it and uh, created let's say an undesirable situation for an abutter so i think you know sir i'm going to let selectman plumbo get to his point thank you let's keep it let's keep it civil i've let everyone run over so i let, let, let let's just make sure we don't interrupt okay thank you thank you 
Uh, so I just wanted to reinforce that that is a very serious issue if in fact you are affected in that fashion. Um, so that is a concern that I have that we may have in the future some very unhappy folks um, to the extent that that does become um, a more prevalent problem. And if that's something that we need to better understand, I can certainly, um, I can certainly agree with um, Mr. Weddleton on that point. Anyone else just on this motion to amend? Um, um, you, uh, and then, sorry. <laughs> sorry, and then Steve, and then Dave, if you have it. Hi, uh, Kristen Ballish, 15 Kingsbury. Um, my concern is that this has been brought up over many, many years. Um, and if we wait for every single person to get fully up to speed, we'll never have a vote on this. Um, I think that the, this was brought by a citizen's petition, not from a board, not from a politician. This was brought by a large group of folks in this community who have done a huge amount of outreach, a large amount of um, publicity um, on NCTV, on lots of local groups. Um, I think it's time to vote on this. Um, if you or myself, or if anyone feels like they have not gone up to speed, I think we have to think about whether or not we've done our full responsibility to get up to speed ourselves. Um, I think we're not going to know more than we know now at this point, um, and I think we need to vote. Thank you. Mr. Lutz next, then Mr. McDonough. On, on the motion to amend only. <laughs> uh, on the motion to amend, I think uh, it's outside the, the bounds of this to discuss the solar issue. Uh, it's a zoning issue that is dealt with with a separate criteria from the green, in the green communities program. We already meet that criteria. We do not have to change our zoning bylaws to comply with that. It requires that you have zoning available for renewable energy installation, renewable energy manufacturing, or renewable energy research, and we meet that. So there is no reason to discuss that. Thank you. Uh, secondly, and more importantly, there are 215 communities in the Commonwealth that have already adopted have become green communities. There is plenty of evidence that it works. There is still people who are trying to undermine it, but it works. That's all I have to say. Mr. McDonough, last word on the motion to amend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. So um, I've heard Mr. Sullivan's uh, presentation uh, twice on this, and uh, a number of people have said that we know all we're going to know today on the stretch code. And until a few minutes ago, I probably would have agreed to that. Uh, I actually earlier was, uh, would have been a no, and tonight, until very recently, I would have been a yes. But something came up a few minutes ago, and even through our advisory meetings, but I don't recall ever hearing anything about the fleet issue. And, um, and as we try to like project out some of the additional costs for some of the town boards, but there hasn't really been any discussion or any information about what some of those additional costs could be if cars have to uh, switch to propane or if we have to buy hybrid vehicles. Uh, you think this is funny. I just think it's a question. Steve, <laughs> so, Steve, Steve. But, Steve. So, no so, that, so that's my point is that I'm, I'm not sure it is accurate that we actually know everything that we should know before we vote on this. Thank you. No, no but let's just, I, I think we're ready to vote on the motion to amend. I, last word on, on this. I, I was I, at the presentation to the advisory board, and it was said at the advisory board meeting, and it was said tonight that Norfolk has already complied with the first four requirements for green community status. The only thing standing in our way is adopting the stretch code. Th thank you. Okay. And the fleet is all set. Okay. All right, this is a majority vote to just see if we're going to vote on the indefinite postponement. If you vote yes, you are voting to a change the main motion to a motion to indefinitely postpone. If you vote no, we go back to discussion of the main motion, which is to pass the stretch code. Does anyone have a question on that procedure? Okay, I don't see anyone. Sir. How many guests? I, I have no idea. I know that there are 180 voters here, a, a little bit more than that. So I have no clue. I have no clue well, on that. I assume that there's a number of, they don't, they don't vote. Uh, visit, if you're here as a guest, you're not voting, you're over there. I don't want to see your hands up in the air. Thank you. I'm 
it's the honor system here. Okay, again, if you are in favor of amending this, changing this to a motion to indefinitely postpone, say aye. 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 If you are opposed and want to stick with the main motion, say no. No! All right, just because people are raising their voices, I'm gonna do it by <laughs> hand count very quickly, one hand. If you are in favor of changing to indefinite postponement, one hand in the air. If you are opposed to indefinite postponement, one hand in the air. Okay, the motion to amend fails. We're back to the main motion, which is for passage of the, of the stretch code. People, first time at the mic, please. Claudia Wilkinson, 25 Village Green. Um, I, maybe I'm missing something here. I'm getting back to the 40B issue. I, I really, really uh, don't I, want to spend quick, much time. Quick question, very quick. I do not understand how, not, how we're better off without, whether or not the 40B, whether or not 40B can waive the stretch code, how are we better off not having it in the first place? I don't, I don't understand why, you know, 40B developers will be flocking to Norfolk because they won't even have to ask to waive it. Yep. And then to Mr. Dooley's point about um, bringing a potential business to Plainville, um, rather than Norfolk, Plainville has already passed it as well. So, Mr. Hathaway as Citizen Hathaway, I believe. Citizen Hathaway, 25 Evergreen Road. Uh, and, 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 what, and husband of the field hockey champion. Just. Another round of applause. Um, Notice anyone who follows Jack on Facebook that after field hockey season was over, he went pretty dark. I did. So. <laughs> uh, until the Boston Globe all scholastics come out, then I'm watching again. That's right. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I digress. Um, one of the just I don't want to talk about 40Bs anymore, but I will answer that last question if I can. Uh, one of the concerns that, that I have and, and I think some other people have is that if, if a developer can go through the 40B process and go through non-stretch code, that would be a concern because we're going to get developments, uh, we're going to get more 40B developments rather than a, con a traditional uh, standard development. Uh, if somebody's going to build 10 lots and they're going to go 40B, they'll build it with non-stretch code versus uh, versus building a traditional subdivision with, according to the stretch code. So it's just, it's just another incentive to go towards 40B, which we don't want. I want to go down a different path, though, and just ask a question about uh, the, the standards. And, you, and in talking to some of the HERS raters, um, my understanding is when they do the modeling, particularly with oil furnaces, um, the, the model with an oil furnace is a very, very high efficient uh, furnace. So the, when the HERS raters come in and start doing that modeling that the gentleman spoke about and get to the rating trying to reach 55, if you're, if you're using a market available uh, oil furnace in your new home, you're, you're starting at a real disadvantage um, because that the, an inefficient market available system is going to be low scoring. So in Norfolk, we don't have a lot of gas, so that takes out uh, the natural gas option and that would put somebody, uh, limit them to building a propane system. Um, I'm not an expert in the fuel system, but my understanding is that propane uh, is more expensive. So my concern is that, that we're gonna build homes that are um, for on a, on a long-term cost a little bit ex more expensive because they're gonna be limited to propane. And what does that do for our, our industry? You know, we have an industry that has, it, that installs oil systems, so what is, I'm looking for information if, if that's true. If, are the oil burner systems going to be at a disadvantage? Thank you. I, I'm wondering, um, Mr. Cronin, if you've, if you've come to the front to, to speak and if you could shed any light on that question, if you want to. I don't want to put pressure on you. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, I, I recommend what's best for certain individuals. I happen to be on the Grange Building Committee and they were an oil customer for 40 years, and I recommended they switch to gas because it was the best for the Grange. 
So I try to recommend what's best for the individual. Now, it is my understanding that oil, because of the, the efficiency they rate it, uh, does make it more difficult in the HERS rating. However, when you look at the cost, in most cases, it's cheaper to burn oil. It's just, it's just this wacko efficiency rating that these agencies have. And I also have, uh, I wrote down some notes. I find this very deceiving, these cost figures these, these state people are throwing out. Uh, this 30-year figure they throw out, does that include yearly maintenance on these air exchange systems? I would say no. Does that include replacement? I don't know of any motor that lasts over 30 years. So you're probably looking at, oh, I don't know, five, six hundred dollars just to replace one of these motors probably three times. Um, a lot of times, and I, I'm in a lot of houses, maintenance is neglected. And if you don't maintain these air exchange systems, they don't work. And then you have an unhealthy house. Now, the, these people make it sound like the energy, the building code right now allows you to build a house with nothing. It's very stringent right now. As a matter of fact, as my understanding right now, with the current building code, you still need air exchange systems. Because this, but this energy stretch thing is, uh, is going to kill us uh, financially as a town. We have to upgrade all our buildings 20% energy-wise. Um, I'm the ch current chairman of the uh, Public Safety Building Committee. I was the chairman of both King Phillips School, school buildings, so I know a little about municipal construction. Now, all these grant numbers I saw up there, I think the highest one was 500,000 <coughs> 500, something. That isn't even gonna come close to what we're gonna have to spend to upgrade efficiency 20% in all our public buildings. I guarantee it you're looking at at least seven figures to upgrade 20%. And that's gonna come out of our pockets. It's, um, it's very deceiving. And also, I have a question. If we adopt this code, will this affect the uh, new uh, fire station we're about to build? If it does, we're probably gonna have to go back to town meeting because you're probably looking at another six figures just to add to that building to conform to this code. This code is very expensive. Don't let these people fool you. Because um, just upgrade maintenance of these air exchange systems. And, and does it make sense that we have the building so tight, we have to bring in outside air and heat the outside air again? It makes no sense. And what do these motors run on? Electricity. The vast majority of electricity in this state is gas and oil. So we have to burn more gas and oil to make more electricity for our air exchange systems. So we're really polluting the atmosphere <laughs> than if we didn't put the air exchange systems in. It just makes no sense. So I urge everybody to vote no, because believe me, this will cost you as a town. Mr. Dooley, last time. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, there, were, there were some of those things discussed on, and I, and I understand it gets confusing, the, uh, the green energy versus the stretch code and things along those lines. So I think that's where some of the confusion happens. Um, but I know uh, uh, Mr. Bakanowski had said that uh, we could actually use the existing solar field as, as, our, um, you know, as, our, as our designated area, the one at the town dump. I spoke with DOER today and they said that's absolutely not true. Um, you would have to designate a new uh, district to be um, solar by right. And once that district is designated, um, you have to, that area, whether it's the municipal buildings or we do um, the industrial park or we do a residential area, it doesn't matter, then solar is by right in that area and has to, which I don't think there's a problem with it, but I just want to make sure we clarify that our existing solar field that we already had would not qualify under the number one, I think it's number one or two, on the one through five list. All right. So All right. I just want to, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Thank you. Dooley, and I, I think that's a legitimate question. I, I do want people, I'm somewhat hesitant to have people say what they asked and were told by other people. Us lawyers call it hearsay, but when you got up and said that, I saw like four people shaking their heads and another four people nodding their heads. And so I, I, I think it can be helpful. If anyone has an answer to that question, I think we have someone from DOER here. 
maybe they could help out, but I really don't want to have a back and forth as to what someone heard secondhand from someone else. So to meet criteria one, you have to either allow for some solar in some locations by right, or allow for some research and development in a solar area, solar field, in some location by right, or some manufacturing in some location for some industry related to alternative energy by right. My understanding is your industrial zone already complies with criteria one and that solar is not a requirement. Okay, so you're at the mic. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff Berkner, Wampanoag Avenue. Um, I had some comments and some questions. I believe that well, when it comes to building a new home, um, it should be market driven. And I think the, home, the potential homeowner should be given the choice to say, yes, you could build to the stretch code or not. It's your choice. If you feel it's important, um, you can spend the money. Uh, another point I'd like to make is I'm not sure what the state of the town's efficiency is in terms of energy, but let's say there was a town that was very inefficient and needed to get up to speed once the um, stretch energy code is passed, they would probably have not much of a, a difficult time doing that and, and perhaps not too expensive. But if our town is very efficient already, that last little bit could be very costly to get, I forget the number, I, th I think it was 25%, uh, an improvement um, in the energy efficiency. So I don't know where we stand on that, but it, I guess that's a question. Um, I also agree with the previous uh, comment, commenter about the um, legislator legislature in terms of if we pass this, including amendments and modifications there too, uh, there's really nothing stopping them to say, oh yeah, if you do a big renovation, that would now kick in. Um, two more things. I don't really understand how the HER, her system works, um, but as, as I understood it from before, um, you get, need to get, I guess, a certain minimum number uh, when the house is inspected. And I think that's different than other building codes where you say, if you build it this way and, it, and it's built properly, it will pass. Whereas if you strive for a number and you don't meet it, then I believe you, you have to then spend additional money. And, and please correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, and then also it sounds to me, uh, based on statements made here tonight, that the, that the current building code has, in the last few years, has caught up to the energy, efficient standard, energy efficiency standards of the stretch building code, so I really question why we, why we need to go th with this. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, um, Thank you Mr. Moderator. It's uh, Will Rigdon, Lafayette Lane. Um, my question is pretty basic. Um, it's actually about the future of the code. Um, so it's my understanding that building codes are updated in Massachusetts approximately every three years. Um, and by the Green Communities Act, the stretch code has to be a stretch above the building code. So the most recent iteration of the building code is the most stringent about, the standard building code is most stringent about energy efficiency. So I think they say the average rating, HERS rating for a standard building would be about 75, whereas a stretch building would be 55, with some exceptions here and there. My question is simply, what can we expect in the future? I'm not sure if there's someone here that can answer it, but what can we expect in the future? If, I, I, I highly doubt state building code's gonna get less energy efficient. So as we step up every three years, the standard code being more efficient, the stretch code is going to become more stringent as well. And at what point, and can we expect in the future the code just to become, you know, are we going to get down to a rating of 35, 25, something that might simply be unrealistic, that's mandated by law because we have to update with the building code? Larry, do you have a sense of that question, if we could answer this gentleman's question? Or? No, I, th these are all hypothetical things, uh, guessing what's going to happen in the future. No, I, I don't have an opinion. That's worth sharing. But briefly, but there was a question. Yeah, the, so, uh, I, and I, I'm going to give you a chance. You, you are doing a lot of speaking here, but you've been up a few times, so if you could be as brief as possible. I will. Uh, I talked about um, ICF International and the, and the modeling that they did. One of the models that they evaluated was an oil fired facility, an oil fired home. That, the, the financial aspect of that was included in the data that, that, that I talked about. Um, it was the most expensive of the four models that they evaluated. However, it was still, it, it was still cash positive to the homeowner in, from day one, and it, me, and it met the stretch code requirement of a HERS 55. So it's not impossible, and uh, we've heard, 
off the, off the cuff, uh, we've heard too many things tonight that are just hip shots, that have no basis in fact, and I really think we should just vote. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Bakanowski, before, I mean, still thinking. The, um, I, I agree with him. I think there's a lot of what ifs in the room, you know. What if we keep digging fossil fuel out of the ground and lighting it on fire? What if more than seven million people die from air pollution? What if the selectman keeps talking about the look of the panels? Well, I don't like the look of power lines and, you know, people dropping dead when gas is leaking in our pipeline. So we can catch up to Massachusetts. They passed Green Communities Act 10 years ago. Or we could keep just saying, oh, it's expensive. Let's let our kids deal with it like me. And I stand up here and say, go green energy. I think we all just need to think about the planet, not the bottom line for a second, because I just want to breathe clean oxygen. Uh, ne next gentleman next to Mr. Lutz, are you? Well, Mr. Lutz has spoken enough. If we could uh, get you. <laughs> not that I ever tire of it, Dave, but. Um... I am Ray Schweikoff for Berry Lane. Uh, I'm on the Energy Committee as well, so bear with me. Now, I've been in the energy conservation business for over 30 years, and all the things that are talked about here, so much false stuff going on. Motors that have to be replaced, if you have to replace a motor, you're going to have to replace one anyway. I deal in refrigeration. People's compressors go, and they have to replace them, and that's just the way it is. Now, when it comes to commercial, that's who I deal with primarily. These people want energy efficiency. People pay us a lot of money to upgrade them above stretch code because they, they see it's money in the bank. Now, payback-wise, the 30-year mortgage, so let's say you had a mortgage that was $800 a month, and it went to $850 a month, but you're saving $100 a month on your electric bill, so it'll pay off whatever. Uh, I'm not too concerned about that. I've been doing this for so long, and I run the numbers economics. I'm an engineer. Um, and to build to the stretch code as a choice, I'm fine with that, but as a choice, we want everybody to choose the more efficient one. It, it won't happen if it's just by choice. The 20% commitment, I'm not 100% clear, maybe Andy can clarify that. It's just a commitment that the town is gonna do that. Where's the money gonna go to? If you go by choice, what you're gonna miss out on is the $250,000, $150,000 a year that you're not gonna get. That's what you get out of choice. Um, so the funds need to be used for studies, to upgrade schools. I've been in some of your buildings. You've already done quite a bit. So whatever's left to be done, probably that noisy air conditioner in the town hall. Um, so really, to me, the future is about taking the money that's coming to us, using it for the town, using it. And I understand the builders. I used to work in real estate. I used to sell land to builders. They're, they're worried about their pockets, that's it. We're worried about, it's not gonna impact anybody that lives here. It's only gonna impact anybody who wants to build something. Nobody here, since they got rid of that rule about expanding your home and remodeling, there's, no, there's nothing. I just like the idea of having everybody be on the same page to be more efficient. Thank you. Fran Sullivan, uh, Mago Way. Um, I'd just like to point out to everyone that we voted to replace two boilers at the library. That could have been a project that we received money from the state. Instead, we paid for it. Okay, just keep that in mind going forward. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I just have a basic question. I missed something here in the actual motion. Um, where is the exemption for existing structures? Uh, it's, it's, in, it's in the code itself. It's in the code, but we don't reference it anywhere here. Is that, I mean, it just I, references the. I, I don't have it all committed, but it. Uh, We're adopting the stretch we, code. we reference the, okay. the code itself. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. I think we're, we're, get, we're getting down to it, folks. Yes, uh, Jim Wilkinson, Village Green. I'm also a member of the Energy Committee. Um, we've heard um, again tonight some real scary things that are perceived to perhaps going to happen if we adopt the stretch code. For instance, there was this 
scare uh, thrown out about how it's going to cost us so much money to get our buildings up 20% uh, to comply with the plan. As Mr. Barry has pointed out from doers, that what it requires is that we have a plan in place. We don't have to, and he can explain this perhaps better, we just have to have a plan in place that we're striving towards. We don't have to necessarily spend the money to comply with the plan. Um, a point was made, well, the stretch code now and the building code are so close, why do we have to adopt the stretch code? Well, if they're so close, why shouldn't we adopt the stretch code and take, and take the benefit of all this money that we're basically paying our electric bills for and giving out to other towns in the, in the, in the state? Another point that needs to be raised, if, if all these boogeymen appear and the stretch code is ruining Norfolk, as we've heard a lot about tonight, we can just as easily unadopt the stretch code as we adopted it. And we can do that at next year's meeting if all these boogeymen come out of the closet and ruin Norfolk as is being uh, perceived tonight, as being uh, set forth tonight. Uh, Mr. Dooley was up and he spoke about politicians and he had some uh, comments about trust in politicians. I, I do believe, trust me, I, I, I do not want to hear anything about personal about another speaker. If you have a point I'm just, about a fact raise, it's not fair to Mr. I'm Dooley. I'm repeating to something that was that. said, Mr. Moderator. What we also associate with politicians is special interests. And what we are seeing represented here tonight from most of the speakers that have set forth in opposition, stepped forth in opposition to this, are the special interests. I, listen, I, 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 I just want, all citizens. I don't think that that's, I, you're Can very you smart on this stuff, but I don't think that's fair. Um, and you, I'm not engaging with you here, so you can sit down. But <laughs> I don't think it's fair to characterize anyone as having a special interest. The fact that somebody may talk from their frame of reference is every bit their right. To call it a special interest or a bias, I, do, I don't think that that's a fair characterization. We all come to this meeting with our, with our biases, and let, let's just keep it to the facts here. George? Uh, Mr. Moderator, I still haven't heard a, an answer to the question, will the new fire station be subject to this code? I don't know. Um, because if it is, you're looking at a much higher cost than we have already uh, appropriated. Mike, I, I don't know. Uh, Mr. Bullock, do you have an answer to that question? If, if you don't, then fine. I don't believe it will be because it's uh, an addition. It's not, a, um, it's not new. So and it's in commercial, which uh, again would be over 100,000 square feet, and it's not and 40,000 for a supermarket, I believe, or? Refrigerated. Or with refrigerated, yeah. Refrigerated, so yeah. I would say probably not. Right, okay, thank you. Um, Sue? Yep. Sue Jacobson, Needham Street. Um, I'm not here to, uh, standing here now to tell you whether I'm for or against the stretch code. I'm just here to ask that people respect one another and respect their opinions. Stop the snickering, stop the boogeyman calling, and behave like adults and discuss it till we can vote on it. I, I, I think here and then here. Marguerite Kaborki and Berkner, Wampanoag. Um, I think we can all agree that we all want clean living. I don't think that's the discussion. And I've always been a person who wants to do the right thing for the right reason at the right time. I still have a lot of questions in my head in terms of what exactly we're doing. We live in a state that has so many rules about everything. Um, and I'm concerned about that. And so I respect um, Mr. Dooley's comments. And I, I'm concerned also about, I wish we could look at this separately from the grant part and the project assignment money and the right way to build a building, no matter what kind of building it is. Because I think we're a little disillusioned to think 
that, oh, they said they're going to give the money, so we're going to get the money. We all know that that's not the case. We deal with mitigation funds every year. So what they say today isn't necessarily what's going to happen tomorrow. Hi. Um, my name is Jessica Watson. I'm 21 Castle Road. Um, can I make a motion to vote? <laughs> you can. I will say, before I, before I take that, I, I, I do see no one else at the mic, so I don't think we need a, another procedural one, and I don't see anyone rising up either. But um, I think we are ready to vote. Before we do, look, th this brought a lot of people to this hall. Again, 180 people here are voting for, again, a rainy December night. I think that's great. Yeah, it got passionate on, on both sides. That's okay. This is a good debate to have for this town. So no matter who wins or loses on this vote, this is the kind of debate we want to have locally. So that's my pitch for May's town meeting. So uh, everyone, um, round of applause. I think Cece started it there. So let's... Okay. So again, this is a majority vote because it's a general bylaw. Um, if you are in favor you will vote yes in favor of adoption of the stretch code. If you are not in favor, you will vote no. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. Okay, so let's do it by show of one hand here, if we can. All those in favor, raise a hand. All those opposed, raise a hand. I think it's clear that the eyes have it. If seven want me to count it, I'll count it, but it seemed pretty clear to me. I don't see seven rising. It is a majority vote, I so declare. <laughs> Article 15. 14. 14. 14. No, we skip 14. We <laughs> skip 14. <laughs> Listen, I, I, if every, we got a few articles left. They're all important. I encourage everyone to stick around. <coughs> Mr. Lehan, Article 14. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's a good thing to have marijuana follow the stretch code, but <laughs> or maybe we could have done it the other way around. But. Uh, I move to amend the Norfolk General Bylaws by inserting, by inserting Article 17 as printed in the warrant. Second. Second. Mr. Lehan. Uh, this article basically would prohibit the sale of recreational marijuana in the town of Norfolk. And cultivation. And all cultivation, forms, right, yes. Everything. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the reason we're bringing this forward is because you, the voters in Norfolk, as an individual town, voted against legalizing recreation marijuana. It is now the state law. But the state has allowed any town that voted against uh, recreational marijuana to have the right to not allow it to be sold within your community. It has no impact on what the law allows you to do in terms of its use. It is merely that someone cannot open a store in the middle of our downtown and sell recreation marijuana. So we brought this forward really as an assertion of what you, the voters, decided at the polls. And we would ask your support for that. Uh, Mr. Sneed. The, the position of the advisory board, please. The advisory board actually, um, by a slim majority of four to three, uh, recommended indefinite postponement of this article, and that is that we were, uh, by that four to three vote, uh, in favor of allowing the sale of recreational marijuana in the town. Um, the bases for our disagreement um, were uh, several. First is that yes, the town did vote against uh, this, and we do acknowledge that, but the vote was 51 to 49, so it's hardly a mandate. Um, if 58 people had not shown up that day that did show up, and another 58 showed up, it could have gone the other way by the same margin. So it's hard to say that it's uh, a really decisive opinion of the town, but yes, the town did vote against it. Secondly, um, there is some chance uh, if we vote against the sale of recreational marijuana that the state may take action in the future to, uh, in effect, retaliate against those towns by denying the uh, tax revenues. Now that's a maybe and if, who knows, but, but it is, is something that has been discussed. So 
And finally, um, I think the majority of us just felt that uh, marijuana is here. If somebody in Norfolk can profit from it, so much the better. Um, but really that we don't see much downside for the town if there was uh, something uh, that was selling marijuana. Most likely it would be zoned where the adult bookstore is zoned. And we know how many of those we have in, in, uh, here in Norfolk. <laughs> Comments, questions, Mr. Hathaway. Uh, Jack Hathaway, Hathaway, 25 Evergreen Road. I, I strongly su urge you to support this article and, and encourage the ban of sale of uh, marijuana. Um, I think I started, well, forming that opinion a long time ago, but then that was reinforced when S Senator Ross uh, came and spoke to the selectmen last, I believe it was last fall. Uh, he w went on a, a journey out to Colorado with uh, a bunch of senators and, and talked to their legislators and, and industry folks about the impact of the sale of marijuana and, uh, and it really has, a, it has an impact on each community. Um, the bottom line for me though is, is you know, thinking about the, the different products. You know, this, isn't, this isn't your grandfather's marijuana, folks. This is uh, a whole new product. We're talking about edible products and, and, and things and I know they can't package them like uh, like candy, but uh, you look at some of the packaging that 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 is out there, and it and it's and it's tempting, and it, and it looks like a you know a candy type product. I don't want marijuana sold in our you know around our schools. Uh, I don't want kids to have any more access to it. So let's just make it harder for them to get. That's all. Mr. Lutz. David Lutz, 15 Ponds, you wrote. Uh, I have a question and then a comment. I did vote against the ballot question, so I come from the position of not being generally in favor of this. Uh, does all marijuana cultivators mean someone who's growing it in the backyard for their own use? That's uh, my first and most important question. No. It does not. No. It's only uh, farmers. No, I'm, I'm serious. No, it's all, it's because, only because there are people who are doing it now. That's right. This does not address Okay. That. Um, and mar marijuana testing facilities, we just had a long discussion about trying to encourage economic development in here. We have uh, medically zoned facilities, uh, or medically zoned areas in town, I think that a marijuana testing it's facility would fit into that. This doesn't cover medical right. marijuana. Um, it's an industrial testing facility. I know, but it, uh, it, it, if it's a testing facility associated with recreational, this would cover. It does not address medicinal marijuana, which is a separate form of regulation. Um, here. Martha Henry, 30 Boardman Street. I'm just curious, I have two different questions. One is, why was it all of these things put into one piece, one article, as opposed to breaking out? I totally agree. I don't want a marijuana shop or whatever they call them in downtown or in the adult district. Um, so I'm just curious. I mean, we talk about we want more commercial tax base and what that means when you d put them all into one. And if you indefinitely postpone it, what happens in between? Can they come in if we don't get back to town meeting and say this? Can somebody come in and put in a license or what is? Yes. We have, um, on, the, on your last point, and uh, someone can give me the exact date, we have a moratorium in place right. now. When, Jack, it, are you do. aware when that runs through? No, we don't have a moratorium in place. Not for recreational. We didn't vote a uh, recreational? No. So we would, it could be picked up again in the spring then, perhaps would be the next time that this town could um, regulate it if in fact uh, we don't have the moratorium in place. But could somebody come in in between and put in a license or a request? I don't know, I don't know the process. But based on the state's uh, schedule right now, right. And, and town council can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I, I doubt there's gonna be any licenses issued any time before our annual town meeting. I think the June. So how, so how do we get beyond the April is the application date, but I don't think anything's getting issued till June, but it, it cuts it closer. Yeah, well, how do we get beyond the indefinite postponement, right? Like, how do we, what if that happens again at the next spring meeting? Oh, then it would be treated as a retail enterprise or classified the way we would treat any other use unless we classify it separately. So can you, anybody that developed the article talk about why it was all, and trust me, I've driven through Forge Park in Franklin, and if you haven't, and you don't know what marijuana smells like, just drive through Forge Park in Franklin and you will, because they have cultivating facilities with air exchangers. Um, 
So is there a reason we put it all into one? It just, it seems a little loaded when you put it all into one. My guess is they're trying to cover the field. Mr. Hathaway. Yeah, I, I, to your point, I think we were trying to cover the field. Mm -hmm. I think if, if you were interested in softening this in the future, I would recommend that we bring forward a motion in the spring that would uh, remove some of these restrictions. Okay, thank you sure. very much. Sure. I'm short. Hi, Kristen uh, Ballish, Kingsbury Road. Um, I apologize if I'm not super articulate. I know it's a very touchy subject for a lot of people. Um, I will say that I'm against uh, this particular measure because of the fact that it's so comprehensive that it doesn't allow for any nuance or us to have any ability to control our actual um, bringing in um, sources of business we might want to. Um, I think that in particular, um, I think we can do better than this. I think that there's a better version that we can come up with for the spring if we so choose. I think in particular, um, the warrant as written is very blanket on all industry so, um, related to the cannabis industry. And so um, I don't think that treating farms, labs, and storefronts as all the same with the same impact makes sense. I don't think that's right for our town. Um, I think that a better solution might be to do what other towns like Franklin have done, which is to route this to the zoning board um, in particular, they have rewritten their zoning regulations um, to say if there were facilities, what type of facilities are acceptable based on town values and town industry needs. Um, and you know, as someone mentioned, there are some uh, labs and there are some fields. Um, and I think those are the types of things that as, as an agricultural area that we are in could be supported by our, by our town, um, would contribute to tax revenue, for example. And I think being able to allow businesses to come to the zoning board or to the town and be judged on their individual merit for the town makes more sense. Um, so basically, I think this as written is just much too broad for me to feel comfortable voting on the way it is. And I think we can do a, uh, we have a better chance, I think we can do a better job is what I'm trying to say. I think that there is a better solution, a better way to write this, that everyone would feel comfortable and give ourselves the ability to bring commercial industry to Norfolk. I don't know who was first, Mr. Dooley or Ms. Katz. All right, Sean. Uh, Mr. Moderator, a point of clarification. Um, could you clarify the motion that it's actually on the phone floor? Is it a motion for indefinite? No, no. So we're not. That was their recommendation, but we're not. That's right. This is one of those ones because the selectmen were the proponents of this. I didn't think right. it was fair to lead off with a motion to indefinitely. Okay. That's postpone. what I just wanted to clarify that because are, the, some people were talking about indefinite postponement. So I just wanted to clarify. Right. The motion is to uh, ban, is to approve so we, this article banning. Um, all right, forms of to, recreational right. marijuana cultivation, sale, manufacture, et cetera. Okay, uh, I guess I would speak in, in, fa in favor of this article then from the standpoint of, um, you know, I, I, be I believe that's, you know, the best course of action given that we, with the Cannabis, Cannabis Control Commission, we don't have a lot of guidance yet. The Attorney General is still working on the rules and regs and things along those lines. And so I think it's safer for us as a town to ban this, do a blanket ban, once we receive all the rules and regulations, once the Attorney General has come out with all of her regulations, um, the CCC has come up with their, all their guidelines and everything along those lines, we can then revisit it on a case-by-case -case uh, basis um, because that way we can determine really exactly what leeway um, we have. We do not know how quickly some of these regulations and licensings will become out. Um, if we do not act now, banning everything, there may be a license. You know, we, we just don't know what will happen. And I would hate to get caught in a situation where someone's able to slip in without our be, uh, being able to have input. I think this falls under the thing, you know, let's, let's get rid of it now. Let's bring it back after town, first annual town meeting or next falls, uh, fall town meeting once we determine exactly what the Attorney General has set forth as the regulations and the guidelines for every single one of these, whether it's retailers, whether it's, um, you know, pot shops, whether it's growers, wh whether it's dispensaries, anything along those lines. So thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bragdon and Ms. Katz, and then uh, I don't want back and forth between those I had a question two. about zoning, um, which is if we did nothing at this point and did not pass this, um, what would be the process if, a, if someone did want to open something? What would they have to go through? Would it be the same as, say, a liquor store? It would be treated as a retail enterprise or in the case of manufacturer or as a manufacturing enterprise or it would go to a broader classification. But there still would be a process by which that um, business would have to go through some process with the town. 
Um, yeah, I think that might depend on where they want to do it. Um, it's a little bit more of a complicated question under, under zoning. Um, I think the, the answer would probably be, and Mr. Byron, as the chair of the planning board, could correct me if I'm wrong, but depending on where you want to do it and how large it is might uh, decide whether or not you have to go through special permits or site plan reviews or other levels of review. Okay, but the idea that someone could come in without review if we didn't pass this would not be accurate? I, I, sit, I, I can't sit here and tell you, um, and perhaps someone on the planning board could, whether or not a retail shop could be allowed somewhere by right. My guess is no, it's possible. It. But Mr. Byron, unless if, if you have any comments on that, that's fine. Otherwise, um, I, think, I think the answer is, is it depends. <laughs> Uh, the chairman can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we do have a, a zoning that allows it to uh, to be in the area adjacent to the. I think adult. that might be medicinal, right? Yes, but a, I, it may also include recreational. I'm not. I sure. I don't believe it does, but. Well, then you would know better than I. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Katz. Hi, Jackie Katz, North Street. Um, so one thing I haven't heard yet is just about the tax revenue that this could bring in. I believe the number floated around earlier was 3%. And listening to the last debate, there was a lot of talk about how to have money in our town. And so I just wouldn't want to neglect that as part of the conversation. So my question for the selectmen is how you talked about the pros of marijuana rather than just why you want to ban it. Um, and as I'm a high school history teacher, so I can tell you right now, the fact that it's legal in Massachusetts makes it more accessible to every single kid. And I'd like some of that 3% money to go to our students at KP, um, to their health classes, to learn about marijuana. Um, and as a school budget that is really tight a lot of the time where health classes are constantly cut and where kids don't have to take them all because they don't have enough faculty, I think that 3% could go a long way. And there's also an additional 3% for co-hosting a recreational shop with a business where you can control more how that business functions. And so you're talking about 6% revenue. And so I'm just interested in how the Board of Selectmen talk about, talked about some of the pros as they came to the decision to um, bring this to town meeting. Uh, I'll leave it up to I'm the, wrong one to ask. the okay. selectmen if they want to respond to that. You don't have to if you don't want to. I'm probably the wrong one to ask because I can't think of any pros for it So, because I voted against it. Um, I, I'm scared to death that this is going to get in the hands of kids. I've got nine grandkids, nine grandkids that live in this town, four children. Um, I have heard and am aware of what's gone on in Colorado. Uh, Representative Ross was very specific about the issues he's seen out there. Uh, I understand, I know a neighboring town has already voted the same bylaw, Rentham, that, that we're proposing for you here tonight, and I know a neighboring town is planning on making it a big business. Um, I mean, it, every town's going to make that decision. Um, I don't think revenue should be the driver of all decisions we make. I mean, um, adult bookstores, although there's one in every computer in everyone's home now, so it, it's almost a mute point. but. You know, unfortunately, you know, there are businesses that create gener and generate revenue that, to me, are not businesses I would like to see in Norfolk. Um, but it is a democracy, and, and if the voters so choose, then, then we abide by that and make it work. But I, I just, it's a very personal thing for me. I just do not want to see recreational marijuana sold here. I, I understand that it could potentially bring revenue. I understand that. But... Um, so to adult bookstores and, you know, there's a massage parlor that just opened up in Franklin. Uh, another one in North Attleboro. I just, I hope we don't have this here in Norfolk, that personal view. I just hope we don't get it. Just as someone who works with high school kids every single day, they can 100% get access to both legal and illegal drugs all the time. I mean, like, there are kids who are breaking up Sudafed and huffing it in bathrooms. So to, I think... When I think about the legalization of marijuana in this state, we have to be proactive about teaching our kids what is responsible and what is not responsible because they shouldn't be doing it. And here's why they shouldn't be doing it. We do the same thing with alcohol, edu alcohol education. We do the same thing with illegal drugs. We do the same thing with sex. We do these things in health classes and high schools, and we need the funding to do those things. So to pretend that just because our town decides to not have a shop, that our kids are not going to be doing this. and 
I know I don't look pregnant, but I have a vested interest in this. Like, we want to make sure that we have the funds that are needed to do that. And if, if you can't answer the question, I would pose it to the other selectmen, what were the pros that you discussed as you came up with this? Or am I hearing that you only discussed the negative things that would come with pot shops? So I don't want Jackie, with, and those are good questions. I do not want to compel the. the no, I'd, I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to. And, man, and listen, like Jeff, hold, hold on, hold on. We're going to argue over this here. Hold, on, hold, hold Jeff. Yeah. Hold on. So I, I'm going to let Jeff respond. I do not want to back and forth too much. There's other people at the mics. I think we heard a, a really thoughtful <laughs> comment by Selectman Lehan. If you have something additional to add, Mr. Plumbo, please add it. But then I want to get some other comments on this too. Yeah, I, I, this is a personal decision, really, and um, Mr. Lehan made some salient points, which I agree with. Uh, I put this in the category of something that, you know, if just one child has a drug problem, affect the rest of their lives, quite frankly, and just one child is enough for me to vote against this. Um, and I believe that the more accessible it is, the more likely that there will be one child. So in terms of any statistics, I don't have them, but I think practically speaking, I think um, the likelihood is greater. We know of cases that have um, occurred with the edible products. Um, I think we had a student in Mansfield um, who uh, overdosed in the schools. So as Mr. Lehan said, this is a very scary thing. And this is something that I would rather follow than lead on something like this. Yeah. And if down the road we feel that the state has figured this out, um, I may change my mind. But at this point, I'm not convinced that we have figured this out. And okay. so I'm against it. Mr. Lehan, just briefly. I will be brief, Mr. Moderator. Um, but I, I do want to answer the question. Uh, Norfolk has been very aggressive at working with our students both here in the elementary system and the middle school system, the, Norfolk, the building that's in the Norfolk town of Norfolk. We've had police officers in both schools. I mean, if you come into this school and uh, Officer Plumpton comes in, you'll hear the kids yell, OP, OP. My children had him, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, he, we have been very aggressive at trying to help children understand the perils that face them today. No one is naive to that. Uh, but I'm very proud of what we've done here. Uh, we've gotten the first resource officer in the middle school, Michelle, who has done an outstanding job. Uh, so we're doing everything that we can and financially supporting all of the educational opportunities we can. I, I just feel strongly that, that we as a community, and I guess I'm reflecting the will of the voters, however narrow that margin may have been, that we as a community want to protect our children as best we can. And I agree with Mr. Palumbo. They'll get access to it, I'm sure if they're that dedicated to doing it. We've had 28 interventions this year. We understand that there's a significant problem, uh, but I just don't want to make it any easier. Yes, this is a broad approach to it, and it may very well be that we come back in the spring and we amend it and we fine tune it, but I, I would rather take the broad approach and uh, prevent something from slipping in before we have a chance, and we don't know that. You talk about all the I don't knows that we just listened to for the last hour, they're prevalent here as well. The, the head counsel for the marijuana situation is a Norfolk resident, our former town council. I've talked extensively with her about this, and she strongly supports that we take this step. Uh, uh, this protects not, us. First of all, please do not take, put words in, in Ms. Doyle's mouth on this. Oh. I've spoken to Ms. Doyle. Uh, well, about those are the words she said, Mr. Moderator. did not want to take a position on this. So your position, let's, let's not do that to Ms. Doyle. I don't think that's fair. Duly noted. Mr. Bragdon. So obviously this is a, an emotional issue. I, I have to say, I, I guess I'm, I'm sort of a neutral at this point. I have a strong feeling one way or another. I, have to, uh, I, am, I am concerned about a multiple comments I'm hearing here that says we need to pass this in order to kind of know what it means because I've seen a lot of federal laws that have, they've done that with and uh, uh, that uh, uh, that we're, we're living with uh, the consequences. So that does concern me. But uh, really, the, the, the question I have is around uh, cultivate, uh, cultivation. The, the current law, as I understand it, allows individuals at their homes, I think, to grow six plants or something. Would this uh, article prevent them? Would that make that unlawful? No. No, no can't. So then what is the definition of a, a marijuana? Is, isn't somebody growing it in their basement, six plants make them a marijuana cultivator? The, the, the personal use is not part of this. Right. Well, personal use and, and medical use is not part of this. Correct, sir. Okay, thank you. 
they sell it out of their living room. Um, I think it's a different yeah, deal. Yeah, yeah. Question right, right here, and then over here. John O'Rourke, Turner Street. Uh, my bona fides is that I spent 35 years in addiction treatment services. I'm now retired, thankfully. And I understand the emotion and the intensity that the Board of Selectmen have about this issue. But I think the article on prohibition of marijuana establishments is overreaching. And I would like to endorse, however I can, the advisory committee's recommendation to postpone the article. Okay, so let me just um, explain a, a couple of the processes here. I, I will take that as a motion to amend the same way I did before, but the same effect would be just simply voting no on this. So no, it would be a different, this would be tabling the Board of Selectmen's motion. Okay. So that would be, so let me, there's a couple of, a few devices here, and this is going to be kind of maybe Sorry, a little excruciating in, in detail. So there's a few things you could do to kind of postpone this vote. Vote. You could substitute by motion to indefinitely postpone, which would kill it. Just it dies. You could make a motion to uh, commit for further study, which essentially kills it for now, but directs the selectmen to study it for a future event. You could say commit to study until spring town meeting. That, that is a possibility as well. So th those are all kinds of different devices, or you could just vote no, which means it dies as well. I would like the first option that you mentioned. To, you would like to, again, so it's a motion to amend to substitute the main motion with a motion for indefinite postponement. Correct. Okay. So I have a motion and a second. So this is similar to what we had on the last one. If we vote by a majority on this, then the main motion will become indefinite postponement. If we vote no, we're back to the main article. Does anyone have, and I, I hope not too much discussion on the motion to amend to replace it with indefinite postponement? Just on that. I'm not seeing anyone rising on that. So I think we can just do a vote on that. Unless, Ms. Van Tine, no? Okay. All right. If you are in favor of changing the motion to a motion to indefinite postponement, say aye. Aye. If you are opposed to that, say no. 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 I think someone's using a mic. <laughs> someone's talking into the microphone. All right. Let, let's just do that with a, a show of one hand, please. If you are in favor of changing this to indefinite postponement, Put a hand up in the air. If you are opposed to that and want to stay with the main motion to ban, put a hand in the air. Uh, did that, I got to count that one, folks. Uh, Mr. Terrio, um, where's uh, uh, Mr. Cronin? You want to count for me here? All right, we're going to do this by uh, a show, uh, or if you could. Uh, Stand. If you are in favor of Mr. Uh, Terry, you, you'll do that side of the room. Um, uh, Ms. Green, can you count up front here? Okay, if you are in favor of uh, substituting the motion with a motion for indefinite postponement, please stand. You're from the middle over. Take your time. Okay, sit sit down. If you are in favor of keeping the motion as it is <coughs> and defeating the motion to amend, Does please stand. Up here.
it's okay. You're welcome to do it if you want to do it. Okay. No, it's got to be close. Uh, it's got to be close. So the motion is defeated. I think I have 77, um, 77 against and 71 in favor. Okay, so we're back to the main motion. This is a close vote, so I, I'm going to suggest that the next vote may come along similar numbers. If anyone has any new or additional information or questions, sir. Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, my name is Larry Clark, Seekonk Street. Um, a lot of the discussion here has been on retail, not a lot on cultivation. Um, I've been to uh, Colorado quite a few times visiting family. Coming out of that airport, going down the interstate, going by the cultivation buildings, inside buildings, sitting in a car with air conditioning, windows closed up, you can still smell it. Okay, we have a lot of farms in this, na in this town. There's no reason if you can c cultivate it, someone's gonna come in and say, I'm go I've got 20 acres here, I'm gonna grow marijuana. Tell you what, you drive by any farm now, you don't smell tomatoes, you will smell the marijuana two, three, four streets over. Just make sure, so the idea that someone brought up, let's pass this, maybe we can tweak it in another year, but let's close the door, especially on cultivation. I don't think people realize the smell that cultivation creates within a wide range. It doesn't stay within that farm. Thank you. Sure. My name is Joseph Florence, 68 Main Street. I'm in favor of the prohibition on marijuana. I'm a retired police officer, 25 years, Commonwealth of Mass. And so I might have some biases about marijuana. But it's personal with me. My son started smoking marijuana in, in the Boy Scouts. Now, some people can smoke marijuana, and it's not a leader drug. People fly airplanes smoking marijuana. My son went on to other things, an incarceration. And I'd hate to see any other kid end up like that, and a lot of kids do. So I'm definitely against marijuana in any town. Thank you. Mr. Dooley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Tech of the Troopers' uh, responses. Um, we are in the middle of an opiate crisis. This is putting fuel on the fire. I'm a firm believer in that. It is a slippery slope. It sends the wrong message to our kids. But I wanted to come up and discuss the tax implication and the revenue implication. Unfortunately, Massachusetts in when they created the law, created an exemption for medical marijuana. The reality is medical marijuana is not taxed. The reality is that most people who are going to be going to marijuana shops and going to be smoking on a regular basis or eating edibles or doing uh, oils or any of those other different things are going to get a medical marijuana card. It is exceptionally easy to get a medical marijuana card. It's even easier now that marijuana is, easy, is, illegal, is legal from the standpoint of you'd go to your doctor and say, hey, give me this. The doctor is not worried about pre prescribing you a drug. It's to be the same as prescribing you an aspirin, where you go to your doctor and say, hey, if you go give me a prescription, I can get my aspirin tax-free. So that would be, it would save a 20% tax. 3% of which goes to the town if we choose to do that. So the loss leader of, oh my God, it's gonna bring in so much revenue for the town. The reality is that most people, and this has happened in Colorado where they still have it taxed, but it's taxed at a much lower rate. If you go to the to marijuana shops in Colorado, you walk in the door, it's divided. If you have your medical marijuana card, you go to the left, you don't, you go to the right. If you go to the left, you pay half the tax that you pe people on the right. In Massachusetts, it's even more extreme, it's gonna be, if you want to pay 20% tax, you go over here. So your, your bag for $200 would cost you $240. If you go to the left, it'll cost you $200. So you're saving $40 and zero going to the town. So we're going to still increase all the problems. We're still going to have all the headaches. We're still going to have all the uh, undesirable aspects of the marijuana bill. 
uh, having the edibles out on the streets, they, and they look like M&Ms, they look like Reese's Peanut Cups, they look like uh, gummy bears, it's a real problem and we're not going to get the tax revenue that is being projected and promised by a lot of people because I'm a firm believer that any do most of the doctors out there or a lot of the doctors out there will be very easily write a prescription since it is for something that's already legal. It's not writing in a prescription for opiates. It's not writing prescriptions for anything else. This is the same as going in and saying, I don't get have to, I don't want to have to pay for my, you know, any taxes on, you know, my ring dings or groceries or whatever, and give me a prescription. So thank you very much. Sir, perhaps the Michael last word. Michael Fulagi, I meant Margo's way. Um, I read the, every bit of the material that made up the law that we voted on at the, at the election. Um, and I haven't looked at it since, so I'm not sure how clear my memory is, but I do recall that there was a paragraph in that law that permitted towns to prohibit the commercialization, all those commercial aspects. And I think this um, article is very consistent with what I recall in that law. So I don't think we're breaking ground here. I think we're very consistent with the intent of the state law when it was written. Um, with that being said, um, I don't think this will have much effect on smoking of marijuana uh, because that's going to be available very readily on a personal consumption basis with the law as it's now written. When you read that law and you read the various industries and the various ways that it can be commercialized and used, I found it personally scary and I really do support uh, us passing an article that says we don't want the commercial establishments in our town. Thank you. I think folks were, were about there ready to vote unless there's any additional comments or questions. Ma'am? You... I'm, I'm sorry, can you come up to the microphone please? My name is Josephine. I live on Seekonk Street. I'm also a nurse practitioner. Um, I'm a new arrival in Norfolk. We moved here in July. I haven't had a chance to get on your list because I guess the DMV didn't have a chance to add me to their list. So I'm gonna, because you live here, I'm, I, I, rare, I don't rare do this that often. I'm gonna let you speak, but, but just briefly because yeah. you do live here even though you're not a voter. I, I run my children here. I left Boston. We left a lot of things behind. I don't want part of what we left behind to kind of follow us over here. This is a chance for your town to get more, have more control over your town. And if you change your mind about it and you feel that there's enough revenue, it's worth pursuing, you can decide that later. But I think if you have the chance to have more control, why not take it now before another business slips in or someone slips in and then you won't have that control. You have that say now, you may not have that say six months from now, four months from now, a year from now. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a motion, which you had mentioned there was one possibility to postpone this um, to the spring. Yeah. What would that motion be? A study. To, for a study. Um, you, could, you could motion to commit or refer to the, the spring, I, I'm, and that is your right, and I don't want you to not make that motion. My guess is it's going to be very similar to the vote that we just had. So I'll, I'll leave it to you if you want to make the... I don't waste people's time, so I will not make the motion. Um, I do want to say that... Before, yes? Can you tell us who you are? Sorry, I said it before. Who you represent? I represent myself. I have a two-year-old. I have lots of skin in this game. I, all of which is about having a family that grows but up this in This is town. not her first time at the mic, as I said before. <laughs> We, we did. I'm very sorry. Yes, we, we did. Okay. So. Um, I live here. I have a two-year-old. I understand the risks of all kinds of drugs. I think it's a little bit interesting that we don't have the same type of um, regulations around alcohol, which have just as many potential issues. Um, and and I, I am very sympathetic to those who have shared their stories about um, marijuana being a gateway drug for them and their loved ones. I think that there is just as many issues with other types of drugs. Um, and so it's not that I'm in favor of bringing pot to Norfolk. I'm not, um, but I don't think this is necessary, and I think it's broad and overreaching, and that's why I'm trying to figure out a way if we can have some other version that people can be happy with, that's what I would prefer. So if I can't get it done tonight, that's great. I don't have any stake in the game besides the fact that I think it just doesn't make sense. Thank you. Okay. 
I think we are there, folks. So this is a majority vote. If you are in favor of the article as moved, which is essentially to ban all forms of recreational marijuana, both sale and cultivation, et cetera, as shown on the screen, you will vote aye. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. Let's just have a, a show of hands, please. All those in favor, give me one hand in the air, please. All those opposed. Folks, the, eye, the eyes clearly have it, in, in my opinion here. Um, if there are seven people that get up, I, I don't think it was even that close. I don't see, seeing seven, uh, not seven people up, uh, the article passes and the bylaw is amended accordingly. Article 15. Is Terrio. Just three left, folks. Stick around. Mr. Moderator, yes. I move to authorize the Board of Selectmen to proceed through the planning process and seek approval of said plan as substantially shown on a plan presented to and on file with the Board of Selectmen entitled Parking Area Plan by United Consultants, Inc., dated April 29, 2013, and upon planning board approval of said plan to authorize the Board of Selectmen to sell the property as approved. Is Terrio, a little explanation? Oh, certainly. Um, we're talking about um, what is the old town hall. Mr. Hathaway, could you put that... Um the, the picture of the actual plan up, thank you. Thank you. We're talking about the old town hall property and um, certainly Mr. Hathaway, if I could defer to him, Mr. Moderator can um, speak to more articulately than I can about this, but we're looking to sell a portion of the property, um, generates a source of revenue for the town um, as on the screen. Mr. Hathaway. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and thank you, Madam uh, Advisory Woman. I'm sure I cannot speak more articulately than you can, but I'll try. Um, so there's a lot of speculation about this one, and, and some on Facebook and, and et cetera. So I'll try and give you the, the short uh, story about it. So this is Old Town Hall. I'm sure many of you know where that is. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a rundown old building that looks like a residential building. It's uh, next to the lot where we rent out spaces for uh, I can't say it's an MBTA commuter lot, but it is, uh, looks and sounds like an MBTA commuter lot. Um, <clears throat> so our idea here, as, as we put together with, it, with an engineer, uh, probably, f I think it's four years ago, is to carve out um, that green area, and I can't use, sorry, I can't use my pointer here on that screen, but uh, to carve out that green area. I'm gonna, I've got a couple different uh, views here for you. Um, this is a, kind of off the, the Google system uh, that we have at town. Um, it shows you, uh, well, in that red area there, it shows you where old, where old Town Hall is, shows you where the parking lot is. So what we're trying to do is carve out uh, that front lot. And Bob, that about 30,000 square feet? About 30,000 square feet of that lot so that it's, we can sell it. Uh, and what we'd have to do is go through the procurement process. We'd, Put it, likely put it up for auction. We didn't put it up for auction. We could put it up for bid and receive bids. So I don't want anybody to think we have a done deal here. We don't. Uh, we would have to sell this through procurement. Um, but the idea is to carve that green area out uh, and then allow somebody to come in and build uh, most likely a commercial uh, establishment. They'd have to uh, use the existing foundation space uh, because there are a lot of uh, environmental uh, challenges with that lot. If you look at uh, if you look at this one, this, you can see that kind of river running diagonally through the middle of the page there. That's running through the, uh, through part of the, well, it would run, continue down. There's like an underwater stream that I don't understand, but it uh, runs down into the other pond and it creates uh, the river act. So we have to have a, a separation from that, uh, that river. Um, and I'm sure my conservation friends can explain that a lot more intelligently than I can. But again, the short version is we're trying to carve out this green area. It's out of two lots, so we'll go to the planning board and ask them to approve a, a change in, in the lot uh, structure. We'll take those, the back portions of the land and make that one lot that the town will continue to own. 
So we'll continue to own the old town hall parking lot that we that refer to. We'll continue to sell off those spaces for, for the residents to use. We'll continue to have that building up in the upper left-hand corner, which is the old water department garage. Uh, and we'll continue to have that uh, path that, that a lot of you probably don't know about, but that goes out to the old town pond. It's a nice area to go for a little walk, if you, uh, if you will. Um, so that's the, that's, the, that's the story. We're just trying to carve it out and generate some revenue that we would use for a future capital purpose that we would come back to uh, town meeting. Uh, we could either put it into the stabilization fund. Um, I know there's been discussion about using that for our recreation, using that fund to uh, help build a recreation facility. Um, that would be something that town meeting would have to decide in the future. So, thank you. Questions, comments? Sir. <coughs> Roderick, Christopher Weeder, Cleveland Street. For years, we've been told that this is the last piece of B1 property in the center of Norfolk. The selectmen have told us for years, we don't want to sell this off. We don't know what our needs are. Tonight, we approved a study at this building because of future needs for students. Last year, we built a garage at this facility to house a senior bus and a building department bus. The building department bus sits outside because of the needs of the school. They needed the other side because the school doesn't have enough storage space. This is the last piece of commercial land we own in the center of town. We heard tonight it's not all about the revenue. We are going to have over 40 units at 106 108 Main Street in our inventory in the next two years. We just approved 40 units at 84 Cleveland Street in a 40B. We just approved 32 units at 25 Rockwood Road for a 40B. We have in front of the zoning board right now over 200 units. We don't know what our future needs are going to be. As a Rentman Plainville Animal Control Officer, I can tell you we don't have a municipal animal shelter. Norfolk, Rentham, Plainville. Medfield does. Foxborough Mansfield does. Bellingham Franklin does. So I can see that being a potential use. There are many uses for this property. To sell it off for 300000 or so in revenue and lose the ability to develop that I think is a mistake. And I also think one thing is missing on this map is when you carve out the piece at 98 Main Street, the entire back section of that is wetlands, protected under the Inland Wetlands Act. So what we're left with is something we can't even use. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Hi, here and then over here. Hi, Kathy Cubitt again on Cleveland Street. Um, I appreciate what that gentleman just said. I was unaware of that. My quick question is there's no consideration to sell this lot or lots privately for a single family residence? Um, or it has to be commercial? I, I don't think whatever would be permissible under law on, on that lot. I think there is some residential allowed in that, that, that part of the district. Um, but I'm not sure that the selectmen have those plans in mind yet. Jack, do you have any thoughts on that? We would sell the property. We wouldn't restrict what it would be used for. So whatever it's zoned for would be allowed. And highest bidder, obviously. <laughs> Easy okay. idea. Thank you. You're welcome. Sir. Uh, Brian Mushnick, Fredrickson Road. Um, the gentleman before me was quite eloquent. Um, my father used to tell me they're not making any more land. Whenever we can't give land away, the town, their, their job is not to sell a piece of land for a small profit. If, if the building is a problem, tear the building down, leave the, the property vacant, and wait. We'll need it. Lots of towns have sold properties around us, and then five, eight, nine years later, they need that property back. If it doesn't cost us anything to sit on it, we sit on it. Thank you. Ma'am? 
Stephanie Ackley, Boardman Street. Um, <clears throat> just want to keep in consideration that there is a war veterans memorial on the property that abuts basically where the parking lot is proposed. Um, and I think it's important to not neglect the people that have served our country. And so I want to know that there will be something in place to you know, respectfully move or relocate um, if this property does sell. Um, because a lot of the names of the uh, streets in this town are named after uh, veterans that have served, um, that have kept our country free and fought for our freedom. So I think it's important um, to, you know, uh, make sure that that's moved properly and, you know, ceremoniously if possible. Mr. Lee Han, then Ms. Wynn. Um, the gentleman that talked about this being the last property in, in the B1 district is absolutely correct. Uh, it is the, the only piece of property we own, and it's been a dilemma for us for some time. The, the issue we're dealing with is that we have a building that is hazardous to the community. We have to do something about the building. So as the gentleman suggested, we could tear it down. If we tear it down, we have to reconstruct on the existing frame, uh, the existing site, existing foundation within a two-year period. If we do not reconstruct within a two-year period, that land cannot be used at all. It's gone because there are wetland considerations and the conservation can speak more eloquently to this than I can, but you know, they, they tell me that there's a river that isn't a river that is a river that goes through there that we can't use or something like this, but it is very restricted as to what we can do on that property. We did not know that several years ago. We, we had grander visions for that property. So we're restricted to what that foundation is for any future site. If we tear it down again, and the gentleman that spoke is on the ZBA, so he knows it full well, we have to build within a two-year period. If we don't, that property is gone for us. We can't use it. That's our dilemma. Thank you. So if anyone has a solution to that, we'd welcome it, because we have debated this forever, and we, 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 don't know, we don't know what else to do with it. And, and Mr. Lehan or, or Mr. Hathaway, if, if we could address the last speaker's um, concern that I, I can imagine that oh, there would oh, be by all means. We, the... we, it, most definitely, we would make sure that that is respected in all cases, anywhere in town. Very, very much so. Thank you. Ms. Wynn? Um, so I have two questions. One is, so if we can't demolish the property, but so, the building, the existing building, but someone else can come in and do it and not be held to restrictions? No, we can, we can demolish it, and, right. but we have to rebuild within a two-year period. Okay. If we don't do that, then we lose the use of that property. That would be true for anyone else that purchased it. They'd have to demolish it and build within a two-year period, but I would imagine to guess that, that anyone that buys it and tears it down is going to rebuild. And you feel that it needs to be demolished well, that's a given. immediately, uh, fairly immediately? Uh, it's been a hazard for some time. The building inspector, I'm sure, can speak to it. But I mean, we have more animals living in it than we do outside. Uh, all right. I, thank you for that clarification. My second question was um, someone referenced having some potential revenue. I'd like to know, was an appraisal done projecting any revenue, future revenue? Was an appraisal done, a bank appraisal? Or, or I've been told from a co commercial real estate person that uh, these projections can be made. Well, so where, what are you basing the, as the Mr. revenue ha as on? As Mr. Hathaway said, we, we have to go through the procurement process. We, we can't just give this to somebody. There are, you know, there are very strict laws as to how this is sold. And basically, it would be auctioned. And uh, we can put a minimum price on that auction. And, and we would get an appraisal as to what we think that lot would be worth. And, I assume we'd come up with a baseline. Okay, and, so there is no data. The highest bidder wins. So there's no data saying this significant. I believe in the warrant it stated it was significant future revenue. We estimate it would be between three to 400,000. Just you personally. Pardon? There's you personally, like no, the Board of Selectmen. No, me personally, actually. So not a bank appraisal. <laughs> I, I'm going to look to Mr. Bullock on that, but okay. he, he, would, he was estimated it would be so between DPW three to four I'm not a real estate appraiser. So I'm just you, asking you if there's been a, an official <laughs> bank right, appraisal. Guys, let, let's stop oh. with the talking back and forth. So, okay. So that answers my question that this is just coming the, from the town's opinion that it could be future revenue. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Over here. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I just have one question, maybe someone up there could answer it for me. Uh, say that we do vote to sell this property, um, and you put it out to bids, and the MBTA is the high bidder. Is, is the potential we could end up with additional uh, parking lots, um, which I don't believe we get revenue for from the T? 
Um, hmm. I, I guess anybody. That, I, I suppose the MBJ could be I suppose in, in theory, but it, it's not a big enough lot that I think they would get any meaningful benefit from that with our lot right next door. But yeah, I guess they could. So, yeah. so, so, so the answer is maybe. Yes. Yes, the answer is yes. John Newhibian from uh, Knoll Drive. Um, I guess I, I got over my initial, my initial concern about this article. Uh, well, I guess one concern I have is I wish it were at the Springtown meeting where we could have more people perhaps, but we have a pretty good representation here. So um, is there some urgency to do this other than the fact that it's full of animals uh, maybe? Uh, and, and the other question is, I know this has been looked at before, and I know there's the whole ADA requirement that if we did any renovations, we'd essentially have to tear it down and rebuild it. But was there any consideration given to tearing it down, rebuilding another small building that the town could use for some reason? And did we get any quotes and estimates on that? Uh, Mr. Hathaway. There's been, there, there's, obviously there's been five or six years worth of uh, discussions about this. Uh, we've had it on Warren articles, we've pulled it off, we've uh, IP'd it. Um, as Mr. Lehan said, Mr. Bullock has gathered information on the value of this. Uh, I think some of, those, some of those discussions, including me, have included uh, contractors and real estate people, uh, the engineer that did this, uh, all giving us uh, estimates in the three to $400,000 range for what this value is. Um, we've also gone to the Community Preservation Committee and talked to them about trying to use CPC funds to restore this. They weren't interested in, uh, in pursuing that. Uh, we, we were going to try and uh, restore the old town hall um, and make it kind of a meeting room facility. Uh, again, the, the CPC wasn't interested in, in doing that. So we're going down to the next step, which we think, because it's an ongoing expense for us, to maintain that building, and it's an ongoing concern. Now the fire department is, is raising it as, in, as a higher threshold uh, for, as a safety concern that uh, we want to resolve this issue. So we're looking to, we think the best uh, solution at this point is to sell it for commercial use. Uh, again, we would sell it with no restrictions. Uh, somebody can turn it into condos if they want to. Um, again, whatever is allowed under zoning, and that's not my expertise. Um, as somebody said, it's the last commercial piece of property in town. I'm not sure if that's quite true, but, but it, I would love to see a commercial use for that piece of property. Uh, we've had some people approach us uh, for it would be a great spot for a small funeral home. Uh, we don't have one in town, so that would be great if that happened. Um, I think that's uh, covered what I wanted to cover. Unless Leader? This property is B1. It is not residential, so it is the last piece of commercial property that the town owns in the center of Norfolk. We agree. I have great respect for our building commissioner, but this building does not have to be taken down today, tomorrow, or probably in five years. I've talked to a prior inspector of the town of Norfolk who retired within the last year who maintained that building for 10 years, and he said the building is going nowhere. I've also walked the building. Yes, we have to trim the rhododendrons in front. Yes, we have to tear down the vines that are growing up on the building. Yes, we should rake the leaves, cut the grass, and yes, we should get rid of the debris that the daycare center left behind the building. But that doesn't mean it has to come down. Also, and I maybe Mr. Bullock can correct me, but I think our zoning laws state that if a building, a residential building, is demolished by fire or other, it has to be rebuilt within two years. And that can also be extended. It does not state that if we take down a building on our own, that it has to be rebuilt within two years. A non-conforming structure, according to, I think it's F7-1, states that only if by fire, earthquake, floods, it has to be rebuilt within two years. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but I think I'm correct. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ms. Wynn. That's not my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to make a motion, if allowed, that um, a final sale would be contingent upon a town vote to see who and what the final plan would be for this building or this parcel use. Can't do that. 
outside of the public facility. So you, the, the, any condition of sale, a proposed sale, a purchase and sale agreement essentially yes. would be yes. subject to a town meeting approval? Correct. So we would have a chance to see who and how this land would be developed. This is land that we purchased with our tax money. And if it is one of the last commercial real estate in town, then I really feel strongly that we should have a vote into how this land is developed. Okay. So here's my thoughts on that is that we could probably, the, the motion could probably be legal, but no one will ever ever bid on it ever for any reason if that was a requirement the town has already decided what can go there by the zoning I don't uh, you know I'm hearing I, it's late maybe I'm hearing the wrong thing but I'm hearing that it could be you know condos it could be a parking lot it could be so I understand that it's a sure. wide opportunity of what could go there but considering what's happening now in town with the development I'm sorry, forgive me, I just need to see definitive plans before something is, is town-owned, I own part of it, is sold. So uh, I'll leave it to you if you want to make a motion and then we could reduce it to writing. That is your prerogative. I'm not going to tell you not to. So if you have an idea for a motion, then... I would like to motion that the sale be contingent, the final sale, PNS, would be contingent upon a town vote to see what is being planned to be put there. And I'm sorry if it interferes with okay. projected future revenue. So I think that the motion would be something like provided that any sale would be subject to further approval of town meeting as to the proposed use. Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I'll take it as a legal motion. Um, I don't think it's beyond the scope, and um, I, there is no second yet. I have a second. So if anyone wants to debate that, we can. Otherwise, let's, we can move to a vote on it. That's a majority vote. So anyone want to debate that specific amendment? Otherwise, let's move it to a majority vote. Okay, so let's just move that. If you're in favor of Ms. Wynn's motion to amend, signify by saying aye. Aye. If you're opposed, say no. No. Okay. The no's have it there. Thank you, though. I think it's important that we have these motions advanced. Um, okay, Mr. Bullock, I, I really don't want to get involved in the what-ifs on teardowns. There's already been other questions raised outside of this on impacts to zoning with carving up this lot. I, if, if you I have something that's really relevant to the, this debate, fine. But if it's conjecture about what may happen under certain circumstances, I don't really want to hear it. No, I just want to clarify that I've never suggested the building to be demolished. Uh, I am the one who suggested that uh, we sell the property instead of demolishing it because of the River Act. And I don't believe, and this is something that you know, town council could chime in on, that once the, uh, the building is torn down, the River Act uh, will come into play, which means that nothing can be built within 200 feet of that river. So that if it's an existing building, the existing building can stay, and I do believe that that existing building can be remodeled and uh, run, uh, rejuvenated to, uh, to be able to meet the, uh, the building code. Uh, but for the town to do this, it's going to cost the town a lot more money to do it than a private developer. We have to pay prevailing wages, and the cost is, uh, uh, on this particular project would probably need a project manager, which is another expense to the town. Uh, so it would be best, in my opinion. Well, let's we not, let's stay, as you're not a, a voter here, let's stay away from your opinion. Those facts are really helpful to this, but let's stay away from your opinion, though. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chipman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. A question on the plan itself. Uh, Peter Chipman, Overly Road. Uh, I couldn't make it out. Is there 75 feet of frontage and 30,000 square feet in the lot itself? I, 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 am, I can only imagine that the lot that's drawn in terms of lot area and the amount of frontage is legal. Assuming I, that that is, in fact, the size, then that is a legal lot in the B1 regardless of a B1 
building on it or not, and I, that would be. I think that there's some disagreement as to your latter question there, M me included. And I don't. I, 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 I lost I, I'm you. I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't want to get into a tit for tat with uh, with town council, but I think that there's some zoning issues here to overcome with anyone that wants to buy it. Personally, as a zoning lawyer. Okay. Um, however. The B1 district requires 75 feet of frontage and 30,000 square feet as a lot. I'm assuming the entire lot is in the B1. Secondly, um, Bob did bring up, Bob Bullock brought up a good point. I'm not sure about the uh, Rivers Act, but I thought there was a certain percentage that applied, not the entire 200. I think that there, the, let's put it this way. I, I think that to call the Rivers Act so absolute, it's a very difficult statute and any construction, to Mr. Lee Han's point and Mr. Hathaway's point, any construction on that lot is complicated by the Rivers Act. To call it an absolute no-go, I think is a little, go, to go a little too far, but the, anyone that wants to build anywhere or do anything on that lot, and I know this from history of discussion of this property, will take significant permitting. But I believe it's a percentage, it's not a drop dead, no go anywhere. It's a, let, let's call it complicated. You're good at that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chalmers. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I'd propose that a recommendation be made for a, a possible commercial, uh, commercial space, whereas it's a lease back. One of the concerns that the town has is that we do not have the commercial space. Uh, builders have come to us saying that uh, they've had issues in the past with um, the, town's, uh, the, the town boards basically fighting amongst each other. Uh, being as someone who served on the ZBA previously and served on other committees, I think that may be a consideration we may want to propose where we would have the monies, we would also be able to determine who we lease it to. Okay, ma'am. I have a very quick and relative comment. Um, I just believe as taxpayers, like the last woman said, that we should have a say as to what is being built there. My mother owns a local dog boarding business um, you know, we take care of dogs that are older, can't go to kennels, they need special medications, and we are constantly booked, like all the time. <coughs> and I love how the guy said, you know, an animal shelter would be something nice to have. I personally don't want to see a funeral home or just some big development there. I want to see something that we could all actually enjoy. Um, I definitely don't want to see more wetlands torn up either, so I don't necessarily agree with this article, but I think that it's important we have a say, you know, think about what we're going to see every day as we drive down Main Street. A funeral home, a place for, you know, dogs to go, a recreation center. I think, you know, it's too quick to just jump on selling off a piece of land to make a few hundred bucks. It's really not that much money, so. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we're ready to go here. This, is, this requires a two-thirds vote because it's a sale of land. Um, so, if you are in favor of the article as written, which would authorize the selectmen to sell something substantially in the shape as what you're seeing up there on the screen, you will vote aye. If you are not in favor, you will vote no. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. All right, I want to do a show of hands. It didn't seem like the ayes had it there. Again, we need two-thirds. All those in favor, raise your hand. Is it a two-thirds vote? Yes, it is. All those opposed? We lose. Either way, okay. majority or two thirds, it uh, d does not pass even by a majority. So is, is what I am declaring here. Okay, so that, that article fails. Article 16 is Terrio. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move to see if the town will vote to petition the general court to adopt the following legislation, which the legislature may vary in form and substance within the scope of the general public objectives of this petition. An act authorizing the town of Norfolk to convey certain land on Priscilla Avenue. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives in general court assembly and by the authority of the same as follows. Section one, notwithstanding section 16 of chapter 30B of the general laws or any other general or special law to the contrary, the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Norfolk is hereby authorized to convey by a release deed to Cheryl LeBlanc 
or her assignee for consideration in the amount of $50,000, the land located at 66 Priscilla Avenue in the town of Norfolk shown, on, shown as lots A166 and A167 on land court plan 6616-D being the same premises described in an instrument of taking signed by the Norfolk Collector of Taxes on September 3, 1986 and registered with the Norfolk County Registry of Deeds as land court document number 502258. The conveyance shall not include the house or the improvements on the land which were unintentionally constructed on the land owned by the town in approximately 1997 as a result of a surveying error. Section two, this act shall take effect upon its passage. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Moderator, I would um, ask that you allow explanation yes. to be deferred to someone who was... Certainly. And Mr. More Hathaway informed. is more than happy to do it. <laughs> you get some coffee. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, if, if, you, if you follow all that, it's, I think it's pretty straightforward. So we have a lot. Uh, <laughs> so everybody vote yes, okay? That, um, and I can show you these old land court plans, which are pretty horrible. Um, but, you know, so that's uh, the road there. You can see the three lots that are... Um, supposedly owned by the owner. And you have the two lots above it that the town took by tax title at some point a long, long time ago. Uh, in 1997, a house was built on at least part of uh, the town-owned property. Uh, As-built plans were delivered to the town, and uh, which showed the house actually being built on the, the owner's property. Um, you know, so the town goes by the surveyors and the engineers' uh, as-built plans and their, their work, and um, we go forward to probably close to 20 years, and at some, I think the, the, what this happened was the owner tried to sell the property, and when, a, when they started doing title search and having the property evaluated, that's when it was realized that the, that the property was actually on, the house was actually on uh, town-owned property. Um, I can tell you that we've been taxing the, the house and their land uh, as if it was on their land for all this time. Um, so through negotiations through town council, um, we've come to what we believe is an agreement. And uh, normally what we would have to do, as we kind of talked about in the last article, if we were going to try and sell this, we'd have to go through the procurement laws, put it up for auction. Unfortunately, then anybody would be able to buy that land. So we have to have file special legislation, which all this mumbo jumbo is, um, which allows us to sell the land directly to the property owner. Um, these are very small lots. Um, it'd be very questionable whether or not it's a buildable lot for us if we could somehow move the house. Um, and between litigation costs and engineering costs, we, we thought the $50,000 was a fair number for the town to receive in order to have this problem go away. That's my story. Anyone have any questions, comments? Mr. Rosenberg. So this is just a, a question. Um, if this goes through and the, this lot is sold, will the um, owner of the house then have the bigger lot of the lot they own now plus the lot that the town is conveying? and? The, is it correct then the house sort of spans the, you know, the currently town-owned lot and part of the um, uh, house owner's lot? Correct. They'll own more property and they'll be paying a lot more taxes. Anyone else? Even though this authorizes uh, the sale of land, it is a request for a special act of the legislature which only requires a majority vote. So majority passes this article. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed? It passes unanimously. Article 17, Ms. Terrio. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Moderator, I move to approve Article 17 as printed in the warrant. Second. Second. And Mr. Hathaway, if we could uh, perhaps uh, you want to jump right back up and help us or do it from there? Uh. 
Uh, I know, I'm getting tired. Um, and I thought I had a graphic, but I, I, there was a handout. So you all have the handout? All right, so this, uh, so we're building, somebody is building a, uh, the credit union on the property next to the town hall, uh, right on the roundabout. Uh, they're gonna have, I believe it's four residential units above the credit union. Eight, my apologies, eight. Um, apartments. Um, it's been already been through the planning board process. Um, what they have done is um, they, they've approved everything. They've got an access out to Union Street, which will be an entrance only. Um, when our former town planner, Ray Goff, reviewed this plan for the planning board process, he made a suggestion that, um, and came and talked to me about it, is that we should connect the driveways. So if, I apologize, it's gonna be, you know, if you look at this corner up here, um, so you connect those driveways, and so that's the town hall driveway where the mailboxes are. So we're gonna try and connect the, their driveway to the town hall exit where the mailboxes are. Um, they'd also have to widen that driveway so they could make it two-way coming in and out, um, and that would all be at the developer's cost. So the, so the planning board approved two plans. One is this plan, which if town meeting approves us giving them an easement to use our property to, for a shared driveway, um, or, and they also approved uh, another plan that had the driveway just going out to Liberty Lane, so it would be right next to our driveway. Um, the planner, Ray Goff, didn't think that was a good idea, having those two driveways side by side, as well as having the library driveway across the, across the street coming right at it. Um, ob obviously, you have all the traffic from the roundabout as well, so it was trying to minimize the number of different activities going on there. So the thought is to just combine, have a shared driveway, that all that development would be done at the cost of the developer. Um, and uh, the developer is, uh, my understanding, it is, is agnostic, is that the right term? He doesn't care which, which plan is approved, um, but the, I can just tell you the, the planner and, and myself thought that this was a better traffic flow for the town. Um, it made some sense, so that's why we're asking for a easement. for and, we, the selectmen have the authority to give them a, a license to do this, but then that would be revocable by our future uh, board of selectmen. So we, the developer wanted to have this as a permanent easement, um, which is only allowed by town meeting. Okay, any questions on that, sir? I just have a question, John Hibian, about the, um, the access. Is there still access from Union Street? It's a little hard to see on that drawing because that that roundabout uh, is a little dicey as it is with people coming down the hill uh, from Walgreens into the into the roundabout you can't really see them sometimes and it it's it's tricky I'm just wondering if there's another access from onto Union Street from there uh, it might complicate matters is that still part of the plan so I think as, and Jack, correct me if I'm wrong, two things, because I asked you this question beforehand, that's entrance only from Union, um, and that hill that's right on that corner is, I believe, getting shaved down based on the, so that it'll improve that sight line a little bit. That's, that's, Jack, is that correct? That is correct, although I would certainly ask the planning board to speak well, more. I think we still have a couple members here, M Mr. Byron or Mr. Weddleton, if they have any um, thoughts on that. Um, We got a whole bunch of you here still, so. Bob, you know that, that's coming. I mean, no. Jay, um, I'm not a member of the planning board presently, but the prior reviews, I know that was part of it, was the, um, the cutting of that site. Of that slope, so, okay. But I haven't seen the final Okay. Design. And if you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Walter, so it's, that was my understanding. hill is being cut down if that's if that's the point that you wanted to get confirmation on. And, and that that is entrance only from Union? It's an egress only. Exit only. Exit only. <coughs> egress exit only onto Union Street. Oh, it's now, e the other, the exit other, only. The other thing I would mention exit. regarding the comment the gentleman just made is that uh, traffic study has been done <clears throat> to 
look at the number of uh, vehicles that pass by the Rotary, come down Liberty Lane, go up and down Union Street. <clears throat> also, sight lines have been uh, examined. Right. And uh, the number of accidents that have occurred in that general area has been reviewed. Uh, the planning board thinks this is a, a safe design. But suffice to say, that's happening anyway. The only difference here, as Mr. Hathaway said, is is it two entrances or one entrance on uh, at on the Liberty? Moment, at the moment, the entrance would be on Liberty Lane and the uh, exit would be onto so, Union Street. So all this has to do is just the uh, the entrance um, area on uh, Liberty, right? It does, that's right. true. Because everything else is already approved. So. Martha Henry Boardman Street. I think in some of the Board of Selectmen meetings, this has been discussed. Is that right? Is that where the, the venue that that's happening? And I felt like we, there was a discussion about extra parking for the rec department in Town Hall that would be related to the shared driveway. Am I misremembering that? Or was that an idea that didn't get fleshed out fully? Or Because people were saying, who's going to plow that? Not as part of the development cost, there's been a decision that way. That was like a benefit to us as townspeople to not that, have to park in the back. Yeah, no, we, we would definitely like to try and, you know, as we widen that road that goes out to Liberty Lane, uh, that driveway, we would like to try and expand that as much as possible so we can maybe put some parallel spots out in the front of Town Hall for the recreation, particularly for the recreation folks. But, so that would be a separate Plan that, that would you be a, develop that would be later. A town cost if we can add so if we can continue that uh, widening of the driveway that goes out to Liberty Lane that would be a separate project but but related and that's so if the town is offering to give an easement to make this property a better property I would imagine it's better for them to have the shared driveway although you you said that the developer doesn't care either way safer I think is safer so why why wouldn't we wrap that in and have the developer get a safer egress entrance and we get a few extra spots I think and not our cost and I don't want to put I thought that was the discussion that was happening in those Board of Selectmen meetings no or no I, I mean I don't want to put words in the mouth of the Planning Board but I think the Planning Board came to the conclusion that either this option or the option of having two driveways was safe enough but, but okay. this is a better option okay Mr. Rosenberg first. So this is another question to clarify things. <coughs> Excuse me. When um, this was discussed at the um, review meeting that was held Wednesday of last week, I had understood that um, that the um, Union Street driveway would in fact be an entrance and the exit would be the shared driveway in Liberty Lane, which makes sense because that's also the exit driveway for the town hall. Um, if things are backwards from that, um, that says that at the Liberty Street driveway, it's the entrance to this property and simultaneously the exit from the town hall, which seems both more confusing and also introduces more danger because we have cars going in both directions. So I appreciate some clarification. If anyone has that, in, in the meantime, sir, you have a question or a comment? Uh, my name is Mark McGookian. I live at 20 Union Street. I'm the abutting neighbor. Um, this whole project has been crazy because I feel as if the developer came into this town and he tried to push me aside being the only well, abutting neighbor. And, and I want you to say what, what you want to say, but this is I, I, really... I'm saying what I want to say. No, I know, but it's not... We're not okay, commenting I've, about the, the project itself. So this developer is moving in, okay? So I've been told by many select men on the board that the value of my house is going to go down at least $50,000 for me doing absolutely nothing. But yet I still have to pay the same taxes. So why should the, ve the developers be able to come in and ask for all these re reductions on size? And I mean, you're turning your head away. I don't know why you're doing that. Um, Another thing, the traffic report was put on the wrong side of the street. I was asked, or I asked that they put it on come, the rotary coming around onto Union Street outside my property. They put it on the other side of the street for the traffic going into town where they don't speed. I have at least 
50 videos of speeding cars on that street every morning where I stand on my children waiting on the school bus. Nobody cares. Okay, the developer doesn't care. He just wants money. That's what it is. Okay, so the picture you have here in front of you is, is not the picture that the developer came to me with. I spoke to John uh, Whittleton, was it? And I had a developer off to my house. Now, they told me a certain distance from my property line would be where the retaining wall is going to go. And I know that's 50 feet. So, right, do you, yeah. please let me speak. I, I, I want you to speak, but. I am speaking. No, no, but you let, you let me speak because I'm the moderator and I'm telling Dear, you, I want your comments to be limited to what's before the town meeting, which is the entrance so my whole on Liberty. Point. The entrance on Liberty. The entrance on Union is set according to what the planning board. So approved. this is my whole point, okay? The, the board passed this already and the only thing I asked for was notification from what was going on and I got nothing, absolutely nothing. So how would you feel if you were the budding neighbor of a developer who's just pushing you aside? right way aside and moving in and then my property has to go down. So with the notifications that I did not get, I am putting forward a motion that this be postponed. Okay, so Thank you. we can put forward that motion or you can, or until we can the, just Until the no. developer comes to me with a proper, the proper, the, this is not the way we talked about it and this was passed without it going through me. The, 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 it's, it should be 50 feet off my property line, and by the looks of the picture, it looks like it's 10 feet. Now, who is giving the developer all this land to move in and just make money where I lose out? So, are, are you making a motion? I'd like to, yes. To postpone this, this um, vote right now okay. so until I get further notification from the developer. We have a second. So, we have a second. So. This is what we've, what we've done twice before today. So if you are in favor, well, first of all, if, if anyone has any discussion on that, we'll have that too. But if you are on, in favor of postponing this, you will vote in favor of this gentleman's motion. And then we will have a, a second vote on indefinite postponement. If you are not in favor of postponing and want to go back to the main motion, then you would vote no. So very limited discussion just on the motion to postpone. Yes. What impact would that have if we postponed it? Would they would just use the alternate entrance, is that correct? I have no idea what their, what their construction schedule is. I'm not sure if anyone else has any idea. We, we spoke earlier about um, small-time carpenters and stuff. I'm a small-time business owner in this town. Um, I do carpentry, that's all. But the one thing that stays the same is the code book for me and a developer. So why does it change for developers? And it's so hard for me, a small little guy, to pull a permit in this town. But I don't All know. I'm trying to do, sir, is, is clarify, if we vote to indefinitely postpone, I'd just like everyone to understand what's the impact of that. I, Besides killing this, would that mean that they'll still go ahead using the other plan? So, Mr. If, you, if Mr. Hathaway or Mr. Bullock has any idea where this exists in the pipeline for commencement of construction, I'll hear it. That would be responsive to this gentleman's question. So, so this has been approved by the this has been approved by the planning board with two different options. One is to have the shared I, driveway. I get that, but I think the question is is the impact. He could still build tomorrow under the alternative. I don't know Correct. where he is with respect to coming in and actually starting to break ground on that project. I have no clue. I, I don't think he's pulled a building permit yet. So he's not pulled a building permit. Okay, so we don't know, but it's it's not tomorrow, but it could be imminent with the other option. I, right. Not necessarily. No. The I'd idea. I'd like to be postponed until I get further information from the developer. Again, the idea to do the common driveway originated with the town for safety concerns, not this guy's interest. So, but we have a motion on the floor, and I'd like to take a motion on that, and that is if you want to indefinitely postpone. Mr. Dooley, are you rising to talk about this current motion or briefly? Has, has it been seconded? It yeah. has been. Okay. I just had a question for Mr. Maguki, and if I, sure. through, through you. Um, it appears on the plans that we have, I, I know you're saying it looks like it's 10 feet on the plan, and you agreed with the developer that it was going to be 25 feet. It appears on this plan that I'm looking at from the sight line of your property line to the driveway is 50 feet. It's marked as 50 feet on this plan. So if, if that were the case, is that, does that solve your, your, your question? Because that's, that's how I'm reading it. 
No, the the fact that I have like probably two or three hundred oak, tree, uh, two hundred two or three hundred year old trees right along my property line, and they want to put a retaining wall there. Um, the main concern is if they drop that, are they going to kill the roots of the tree? If the tree is falling onto my house or onto a car that's going to be parked in the lot, who's going to be at fault? Okay, I'm, I'm not the one, that, not the one that's doing no this construction. Forth. Okay, okay. This should not be like this. Okay, no, I, I just wanted to apologize. I misunderstood. I thought he was saying that it was, the agreement was 25 feet. And Mr. Plumbo, briefly. There was no agreement, so, uh, Sean. Okay, uh, there was no let, agreement. No, no, let's, let's back and forth. No, just a, a comment, you know, in the spirit of you know, being sympathetic to a resident, I think the answer to this question may matter to, to folks, and that is, and perhaps you might ask, um, was the abutter notified as part of the process in oh. terms of the planning board application? There was an abutter notification. I just want to make sure that the gentleman hasn't, um, you know, been overlooked in terms of those responsibilities that we have as a the, the, the former planning board proceeding. I don't think that's what he's suggesting. May I speak? So Briefly. when at the, the first time when I found out the credit union was going in there, I went to the credit union and they told me they would get back to me. That was a year and a half ago, nearly. Then I went to the town hall, and then they told me to get back to me. And that was a year ago. And nobody has got in touch with me. So like, why, do the, why are the developers allowed to come in and make a fortune, and I'm not doing anything? I'm just living here. I'm still paying the taxes. But yet my property is going to shoot down. Okay. So we have a motion to amend on the floor to change it to indefinite postponement. If you are interested in that, you will vote aye. If you're not and want to return to the main motion, you will vote no. So all those in favor of the motion to amend, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Show of hands quickly. All those in favor, say aye or put a hand up. All those opposed? This is, it's, it's close. Uh, if I could get some, uh, I got to count it in fairness. Um, do I, did I lose my counters? I got one. Did, yeah. did I lose George? Yeah. Yeah, he... George left. Andy, I'm enlisting you if you could do this side of the room. If you're in favor of the gentleman's motion to change it to indefinite postponement, we'll do up front here, um, Paul. Um, put, uh, stand up, please. If you're in favor of indefinite postponement. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not voting. I'm tempted to vote this way, just to get this over with. I'm going to build those two driveways. I was going to build one driveway. I mean, he's building two, you know, but the Union Street driveway is not going to change. Right. So, but I don't think the public won't answer a simple question. Did they, did, to me, it sounds like they aired. I think 24. Okay, sit down, everybody. <laughs> If you are not in favor of indefinite postponement and want to stick with the main motion, please stand. So oh, the indefinite, um, the 21, okay, 46. Um, that motion fails, so we are back to the main motion. Any further discussion on the main motion? Mr. Chipman. Peter Chipman, Overly Road. Um, as Jack mentioned, the builder itself or the developer itself on this site is agnostic, which is the correct word, Jack. <laughs> Um, and doesn't care one way or the other. He got a very rare approval of having actually two different driveways in site plan. I don't think I've ever seen that in front of the planning board in Norfolk before, but you know, something new every day. My question is, if he doesn't care, and both have been deemed safe despite comments to the otherwise, then why are we permanently placing a lien against our town hall property, who knows what could happen in the future? Because from what I understood in the past, we never ever use public property for private development. Just a question for all involved. 
Kerr, you have a comment. For the reasonable person. Question. Uh, Chris Henry, 30 Boardman. Uh, so I have similar objections uh, that uh, both plans are uh, allowable, both plans are safe. Uh, why give away town property? Um, uh, the Board of Selectmen, Jack Hathaway, uh, are all on record uh, in the past saying uh, they can't ever remember an instance of uh, the town uh, giving away town-owned property to a private developer. Uh, I think it's a slippery slope uh, starting that uh, process now. Uh, so I urge people to uh, vote against that. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Weider. Two points. One is a lot of effort went into the town hall when it was built. It has a circular driveway. Probably most of you grew up in towns that also have circular driveways at their town halls. They don't have little cutoffs that go into other developments. Um, Medfield has a beautiful town hall with a Starbucks next to it. Everybody would have liked to have had access to the Starbucks via the town hall parking lot, but they denied it because they want to preserve the look of their town hall. It has a circular driveway. It's the center point of our town. We have a copper roof on our town hall. You want that to stand alone. You don't want to have a cutoff to the left. Also, I agree. We've made it a policy, including emergency access roads. 25 Rockwood Road, twice the zoning board asked the Board of Selectmen for emergency access on town land over by what was Kids Place. Twice it was denied that the town does not get involved with private developers and give easements. I would ask you to vote no on this article. Thank you. You have something new. I have a question uh, for some clarification. So I did hear in one of the meetings that, uh, that uh, Mr. Hathaway mentioned that uh, Liberty Lane is in fact two-way. Uh, is that correct? That's not a one-way loop, that is two-way traffic? Uh, and would that further add to the confusion of two-way traffic in such a really narrow road? Well, Liberty Lane is a two-way road. Uh, I assume you mean the driveway in front of? Yeah. That is, you can ask, double check with the police chief, but I, according to other sergeants, uh, there's no restriction for that being one, one way. So that's a, that's a two-way driveway. Normally, people drive down towards the mailboxes. But, but, but don't anyone get any bright ideas. Let's, <laughs> please, let's, let's just keep, keep using it as it is. Okay, I don't see any further uh, folks up at the mic. I am anticipating that we will count this again. So kind of stick close to your seats. All those in favor of granting this easement, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. no. Sorry. Okay, let's just do a show of hands just in case oh, people no. are Come losing on. their that was, a, that was a no. That was a That was my no. That was a no. <laughs> I want everyone to put a hand up in the air. Hey, 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 sir. All those in favor, put a hand up in the air. All those opposed, put a hand up in the air. Okay. The, the, the no's have it. It would have required a two-thirds vote anyway. Um, the no's have it. That is our last article of the evening. Can I have a motion to adjourn? It's great reviews. Thank you. Second. All those in favor. Thank you, everybody. Suppose a good building.